and we've had a few false starts, but we're finally here. Um, okay, so let's get into um, our first slide, which um, Corey is going to take us through um, some announcements of upcoming events for Signum. Yeah, just a few things going on here. We have, of course, uh, we're in August now, which means there are two things that are on the horizon. Uh, first, of course, we've got our fall semester, which is there on the right. Uh, that starts at the end of this month. So if you're thinking about auditing any of our courses, or if you've, uh, of course, if you are, are are registered and haven't chosen your courses yet, sooner is better than later. And of course, there's still time even to apply. So uh, these are the courses that we're offering this fall. The one in the center there, Germanic Myths and Legends, is our, uh, our our brand new course this semester, uh, and uh, uh, you know the the uh, other courses are courses which have been taught before, and have I'm really excited to see them again. Uh, uh, the Tolkien in Contact Context course. Um, uh, from Sarah Brown, C.S. Lewis, and the Mythology of Love and Sex with Brenton Dickinson, uh, Modern Fantasy class, and the in and of course our Intro to Germanic Philology. A really fun semester this fall, uh, so I hope that you will look into those courses. The other thing, of course, we are coming into fall moot season again. It is time for a new round of regional moots, uh, and our first two moots in the fall uh, is first is our new our brand new moot, the long-awaited New England moot, which we have finally uh, gotten together. So that is happening in Central Massachusetts and Amherst, Massachusetts. Um, on September 29th, uh, Sunday, September 29th. Um, so that's going to be a lot of fun. Some people have been teasing me about calling that central Massachusetts. Some people consider Amherst Western Massachusetts. Western Massachusetts please. But look, like I, I'm a Williams grad, right? So Williamstown is Western Massachusetts. Williamstown is West, Boston is East, and everything else is in the middle. So that's like how it is. So, you know, like, uh, anyway, <laughs> so that's, I'm sorry. So uh, anyway, it's going to be great. Uh, 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 you know, we've, uh, I'm, I'm excited about Amherst as a location because it'll be uh, easy to get to for people to come down from Vermont and, and from New Hampshire and up from Connecticut. So we're hoping to be able to, uh, and even I think uh, talk to some folks who are going to be uh, coming up from New York for this too. So it should be a really great time. Uh, the topic is speculative fiction and children's literature. Uh, so that should be a really f some really fun discussions there. Um, anyway, so that is Sunday, September 29th. And, and then the best on, time on, of year to be in Massachusetts. Absolutely, yeah. Doing New England mood in the fall was kind of the plan, actually. We were really excited to do that. So uh, it should be just lovely. Uh, and then, of course, Middle Moot, our third Middle Moot now, Middle Moot 3, which is going to be back in Iowa this year. We were down in Kansas City last year, back up in Iowa this year. And that's going to be on Saturday, October 12th. So uh, excited to uh, move back to the northern part of our of our Midwestern moot, uh, and uh, uh, hoping we had a wonderful crowd la last year at Kansas City and the year before in Iowa. So really looking forward to uh, seeing folks again there. We have a couple other moots that are uh, that are in process. We're talking about Magnolia Moot in the southeast and Bay Moot in the San Francisco Bay area for later in the fall. Uh, so we'll have some more information on that later on. But these are the first two that are coming up, and those are our announcements for tonight. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so reminder of our next two movie clubs um, on September 5th. Our next one is uh, the Netflix slash BBC miniseries of Watership Down um, by special request from Corey Olson. Uh, <laughs> we, we had a strict um, no TV policy for a while, um, kind of thinking that there were other realms for discussing miniseries and stuff, but um, Corey specifically requested this one since he hasn't had a chance to talk about this yet. Um, so if any of you haven't checked that out, please um, do so before September. Um, it's only four episodes, like four one hour episodes, so it's very doable. Um, yeah. and, and should pair well, hopefully, with Corey's Mythgard Academy sessions on Watership Down and and the book and the 70s uh, animated film and everything. So, yeah. um, and Corey's going to join us for that as well. In case I didn't say that. Yeah, really excited about that. And lots of people, uh, you know, have been asking about it ever since it came out. You know, because we did the the Mythgard Academy series on that. And when are we going to talk about the the new series? Um, so really uh, 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 glad to you know have you guys hosting that and helping us with that uh, discussion there. At least it's not like a long-running TV series, so it's more of a bending of the rule than an absolute breaking of the rule. But 
that. Right. Yeah. It's like all these people now who say like their show is like it's a it's a twelve hour film, like whatever <laughs> exactly. that means. Like we'll just exactly. talk about it as a four hour film. Four hour um, film. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Um and um and then after that, um, we will be talking about Pan's Labyrinth, um, Guillermo del Toro's um movie, which is one of my favorite movies ever. So I'm excited about that one. Okay, and then, um, so why don't we go around, just in case anybody doesn't know who we are or catches this on YouTube later, um, I'm happy to be joined by an all faculty uh, panel, which is exciting for me. Um, so I'll start, um, I'm Kat, I'm one of the hosts of the Mythgard Movie Club. I've also graduated from Signum and continue to volunteer as the academic coordinator. So if you're registering for classes, you'll probably exchange some emails with me. Um, Corey, do you want to go ahead next? Excellent. Yes. Uh, I'm Corey Olson, president of Signum University, and uh, we just did uh, Sir Thomas, the all of Sir Thomas Mallory uh, in the Mythgard Academy uh, over the most of the past year. Uh, so I've been thinking about a lot of our Arthurian things lately, and I'm uh, excited to talk about Camelot tonight. Serena, do you want to go ahead next? Sure. Hi, I'm Serena Higgins. I'm on the faculty here at Signum and a former department chair at Signum, currently a PhD student at Baylor University in Texas. I'm also the editor of the book, The Inklings and King Arthur, which we recently used for a class here at Signum. So I've also been steeped in some Arthurian things for several years. Um, and I'm the last, I think. Um, so hello, my name is Gabriel Schenk. I'm also on the faculty, uh, and I recently came off teaching the Inklings and King Arthur course at Signum over the summer with Serena and Maggie Park, um, which, uh, as Serena says, used uh, her most excellent book, uh, The Inklings and King Arthur, as the textbook. Um, before that, I was um, uh, I did my PhD in Arthurian literature at Oxford University. Uh, and I still am based near Oxford, so I am coming to you in, in the middle of the night. There's a kind of midnight feast feel to this uh, discussion for me. Um, and uh, I hope I can sort of, I don't know, bring in some um, knowledge of merry old England, if not Arthurian literature, to the discussion. I thought you were going to say witches or something because of the hour. <laughs> <laughs> that too, that too. This movie's a little um, lacking in witches, I have to say. Um, mm. Yeah. I can't so, hold breath, by the way. Yes. Well, mm. we're gonna we're gonna talk about all of that. So, um, yeah. So Arthur Harrow says that he thinks about Arthur things too. So yeah, I'm definitely <laughs> much as I love Arthurian uh, everything. I'm definitely a bit out of my depth here. So I'm excited to see like you know what all the experts have to say. Um, since you well, know, all of really like, just, I have a PhD from Oxford in Arthuriana. The rest of us should just go home and go to bed. The rest of us, <laughs> well. are like, I just read like T. H. White every so often. Um, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, that's all you need great. to do, especially for this film. I would add exactly. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 Um. So I guess like, well, I'll throw it out to the group. Um. What maybe maybe we can start with what was your relationship maybe to this movie specifically or if you want to say arthurian literature in general and and how did you come to this movie like were you familiar how does i don't know if anybody's ever seen this on stage um had you seen the movie before have you never seen the movie did you read the once in future king what was your way into watching this film yeah anybody can can i go first because then yeah. i'll put it into a context that i think um might you know others can talk into i mean i saw that i saw the film years and years ago before i even knew too much about arthuriana probably the only other arthuriana i encountered was the animated sword in the stone and also some little adaptation those little kids books you know that had like an illustration on one page little chunky books but i've seen it again a couple of times since and it's, um i find it very moving i find it um a really excellent film that really just breaks my heart every time but my interest in Arthuriana has has always been there, but has been pretty marginal until Tolkien's Fall of Arthur came out in 2013. And then I said, wow, at least the three major inklings wrote some serious Arthurian stuff. And then I found out that Owen Barfield has had as well. And then if you bring in Roger Lancelin Green, and then depending on how you define Arthuriana, you, know, you can kind of say like everything they ever wrote was Arthurian in one sense or another. And then I had the privilege of working with 
all the people in the book and just seeing how this story is really a web that connects to so much of British and American and even Irish literature and even more than that and just continues to get adapted over and over and over. So even this film, like there are parodies of it and there's snippets everywhere and there are cultural references. So it's, it's like the story that just keeps growing and will never die. Yeah, for me, I, this is this is not a film that I had seen. Like, it's 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 a film that's relatively recent for me. That is, I only came to see it in the context of like being interested in 20th century adaptations of Arthurian lit. So I kind of came came to uh, medieval Arthuriana first. I had seen the Disney Sword in the Stone when I was a kid. Um, but it, it didn't make a huge impression on me. Like I definitely don't have that as like my first major, uh, it's not that I disliked it, but I didn't, I, I didn't own it or anything. So I didn't watch it multiple times. I just like saw it once and, 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 you know, remembered it, but it wasn't like a, you know, a corner, like a, a hallmark of my childhood or anything like that. Um, but anyway, I, I, you know, I loved Arthurian stories and reading Arthurian adaptations and things, and then finally discovering Maori when I was, I think, a junior in high school uh, and reading Maori. Uh, and that was that was really kind of what was my springboard into medieval literature as a whole, really. Um, so then, of course, reading a bunch of things in the in the you know medieval Arthurian tradition, and after that, largely through teaching, honestly, um, wanting the first time I designed my first Arthurian literature course to be looking at some modern adaptations of the story and how that how that story came to continue through into the 20th century. Um, but I didn't I didn't use this one <clears throat> in class. Um, I uh, I did mostly more modern stuff than uh, uh, than this one. But that was when I saw it first. When it was when I was like doing my research on uh, you know uh, you know major 20th century adaptations. I did read uh, 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 T. H. White when I was like in high school too. Um, but um, but anyway, yeah, it's it was fat. I hadn't seen this film in a long time. So coming back to it now, you know, before this session was the first time I'd seen it in many years. And it was really interesting, especially coming right back to it after having, uh, you know, gone through Mallory in such detail. It was there were definitely some things that, you know, I was thinking about it that I, I, I wasn't really noticing before, like exactly how much D.H. White this film is was something that I, you know, had noticed before, but I hadn't really been thinking about as much as I as, as I was this time. Um, Gabriel, do you want to go ahead and then I'll finish up? Sure. Um, okay, so I also watched the Sword in the Stone Disney movie when I was a child. I watched it as my at my grandparents' house. I have a very clear memory of of my grandmother showing me that film. Later on, found out that my grandparents um, gave each other first editions of um, the the T. H. White books. This is um, these are all the first editions here, and they've inscribed them with personal. Um, messages in the 1940s and things. So I think those books meant something to them. Um, but uh, I, I loved it at the time. Um, I, it didn't make a huge impression on me, but it was very much bound up with a lot of other things that were going on in my mind at the time. Uh, I was uh, reading Narnia for the first time. I was discovering Tolkien. Um, and so this kind of world of chivalry um, and the world of, of fantasy have always been sort of blended together for me. Um, and then when I came to uh, have to uh, decide on a topic for my PhD, I thought, how can I write about magic and other worlds and fantasy um, and get accepted by, um, you know, the establishment? You know, you're supposed to do kind of a serious topic or whatever. So I thought <laughs> King Arthur's my way in um, nice. because he's like serious, but right. he also has dragons and magic and all that good stuff in it. Um, so I've always thought of, of King Arthur as the gateway for that stuff. I hadn't actually seen the Camelot film until uh, this, um, uh, until uh, I, I just finished watching it tonight, actually. Um, and uh, I'm very, very sad that I didn't watch it before. I'd heard a rumor that um, there wasn't it wasn't really anything to do with T.H. White, and that's completely wrong. Uh, there's a lot of T.H. White in here, as you say, Corey. Um, and the great tragedy is that I did a fifth of my PhD on T.H. White. 
Um, in fact, my main focus of my thesis is on the once and future king. And I went to Texas and I went to look at all his manuscripts and his journals and I immersed myself in T.H. White. I, I thought I had experienced everything there was to experience um, to do with T.H. White. And then when I was watching this film, I was thinking, God, that's from T.H. White. That's from T.H. White. I was I was I was so delighted that whole uh, whole passages of not just the once and future king but specifically the sword and the stone are used such as the um an incredible um the only the best thing uh, for when you're sad is to learn something speech um so i was very moved and delighted to to see all that um but also very regretful that i hadn't seen it before i had actually read it um weirdly enough um because it, it was sort of on the periphery of my vision and i thought well i i should check it out a little bit so I read the um the songs in a book I read the musical score and I thought well this is nonsense this has got nothing to do with anything so I didn't <laughs> pursue it further um but it's the bits in between the songs that are the real th white bits um so that's my story are, are his papers in the Harry Ransom Center yes exactly yeah all all his all his manuscripts and and um, journals apart from a few odd bits and pieces which are in queen's college cambridge where he was um, an undergraduate and then there's another journal that's missing that only sylvia townsend warner has seen i don't know where it is but anyway most of the stuff is in harry ransom there's about 20 boxes of it actually it's well worth seeing if you're in the area in austin which serena sort of is exactly <laughs> um Interesting. Yeah, we have a bunch of people in the chat saying, or in the questions saying that they came to Arthurian literature through T.H. White, either through the book or the Sword in the Stone cartoon. Um, and yeah, it's sort of similar for me. Um, I did, I mean, I guess I was sort of very vaguely familiar with some Arthurian, but not really. Um, I hadn't read any Arthurian literature, had seen um, probably more movies than anything growing up saw the Sword in the Stone cartoon. Um, I remember enjoying that um, kind of campy um, mini series of Merlin with um, Sam Neill and like Helena Bonham Carter and stuff that was on in the 90s. Um, mm -hmm. was one of mm -hmm. my first exposures. Um, and when I was in high school, uh, I think it was 10th grade, we did an Arthurian literature unit um, where they kind of took us through the kind of Mallory's version of the story, but um, each section of the story we would read like a different author's interpretation. So we did kind of the sword in the stone for when Arthur is young. And then it went on to a, a, a modern translation of Mallory for the middle. And then we looked at um, Tennyson's Idols of the King for the end of the story and kind of pieced it together like that. And um, and that was my first exposure. And I especially remember falling in love with T.H. White's version and going on on my own and reading the full Once and Future King just sort of um, on my own time. Um, and I'm sorry to hear that they've since dropped that unit because of course they did. Um, so um, I, my memory, um, my grandfather loved this movie um, being sort of in his, prime in the 60s when this came out and having good kind of Catholic democratic values and the Kennedys and all that. Um, this movie was very important to him. So um, probably knowing that I was reading that stuff, um, he showed it to me. And I think I was polite, but I don't think I appreciated it very much at the time if I was around 15 or 16. Um, and there is a lot of white in here and there's a lot more of it than I remembered because my my impression at the time was more my disappointment of what was left out. Um, so I, I maybe want to get to some of those things too of, I was so in love with the whole um, Orkney faction side of things. And right. to kind of get to this movie, I like, I am ready for that. And to have no no Gareth, no Gawain, none of that. Um, and, and some other things as well. I, I think I was mostly overwhelmed by my disappointment at that and was distracted from appreciating what is there. So it's interesting to come back 15 years or whatever later, um, having read a lot more and with a different perspective and appreciating a little bit better, I think, what the movie does do versus what I wish it would do. Um, yeah. So yeah, like overall impressions, I guess, like, you know, anybody take it up. And we've got Arthur on the the screen here. Um, 
with some very TH white passages of this stuff about might for right, it's very civilized. So like this is a very um, TH white idea um, and was very much of its day of, of the kind of World War II era that he was writing, but then means something different in the Vietnam era. So, um, you know, there's a lot I think to dig into. So anybody can kind of pick it up from here and where would you like to go first? There's something really interesting that a lot of Arthurian works do, this one does, and I noticed that the trailer really emphasizes it, which is the trailer kind of has two stories pulling against each other, one in the voiceover and one in the visuals. The voiceover in the trailer is only about the love story. Like, that's it. It's just like, this is the greatest love story ever told. But then the visuals, are a lot of court pageantry and then a lot of military, you know, a lot of war scenery. So if you had absolutely no idea about the Arthurian story, you might wonder, this is the greatest love story ever told and you're showing me this desolate battlefield? Like what, what's going on here? But that's one of the reasons that these tales are so frequently adapted, I think, is that they have so many sub stories within them. They network so many stories together that like whatever you're into, we can make a version that emphasizes that, right? <laughs> and I think the musical does a, does a great job of balancing those two stories as well as the political aspect and other personal stories as well. Even though it's just a selection of the, you know, the timeline of, of T.H. White, I think it still weaves mm -hmm. those together really well. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I mean, one of the things <clears throat> that I was really struck by uh, on this watching through it was how little violence there was you know i mean had like first of all like the body count at the end you know the, the quite shockingly small body count at the end there I mean, how many corpses did we get on screen none i mean it was it was you know uh that was that was uh that was um uh odd in a sense, you know, we had like a couple fights, but not much really in the way of fighting. Um, people talked about violence much more often than violence actually happened. Um, you know, and the one big sort of culminating moment in the middle was the, you know, the 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 tournament, right? The tournament with the miraculous, you know, or maybe miraculous healing, the uncertainly, right. the dubiously miraculous healing uh, of which one was it? Was it Sir Dinadin who got it was, oh, yeah, almost killed? Yeah, yeah. Um, was anyway, killed. so was killed. Yeah, was uh, yes, yes. The uh, the he was at least mostly people. dead. Yes, <laughs> I, that's what it rather looked like. But um, anyway, I, I was yeah. I mean, I would say you know, Serena, of those two things that the trailer was kind of selling, um, I think the voiceover was right. <laughs> The visuals were misleading. Uh, ultimately, I think um, because it's it 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 did not seem. It was interested in the in, in the concept of of violence, right? right. And it was incept. It, it was interested in the concept of 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 physical prowess, right? That was a that was an important issue in the film. But it was something we talked about about you know ten times more than we actually demonstrated or 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 or, or, or dramatized. But isn't that part of the point? Because as this slide shows, like that's what Arthur is trying to establish. You know, he's he's asking all these questions of what is a good king, what is a good government, and what do we do with all these violent young men and all their energy? You know, where do we where do we channel that? And then eventually, T. H. White, of course, is much more explicit about it. He moves from channeling it into tournaments to then channeling it into the Grail to finally he says, no, law has to, you know, law has to be the rule, not just physical force. So I suppose in a way, like our not seeing more battles kind of shows Arthur's success, even though it's like yeah, no, I mean it's definitely consistent in that way. I mean it's consistent with that overall vision, uh, you know, in, yeah. in, in a way that I do think is interesting. I mean, and thinking about law, you think back to the. Uh, so right after the wedding happens, right, and we get the kind of preliminary Arthur and Guinevere meeting each other and getting to know each other and then getting married, right? And the 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 transition scene from that is the is Arthur with a map of England, right, with all the little mm -hmm. kingdoms, uh, right, and talking about how you have all of these little kings and all of these little kingdoms with all of their little boundaries. And he uses like three or four synonyms for unlawful. Like unlawful is what he keeps emphasizing. They're, they're illegal kingdoms and they're illegal borders and they're, um, 
and it was it was it was, it was on the one hand it was about assertion of law right um, but of course it was also we need an alternative to violence right so he wasn't it what he wasn't just establishing from the beginning this kind of anti-war campaign right it wasn't merely you know, the boys will get to fighting if we don't give them something constructive to do. So let's get together and do this round table. I mean, th that was the element too, right? But that element of law, um, you know, I'm supposed to be the king around here. And so therefore we need to get to build a system where everyone is acknowledging that, but hey, let's do that without just me going and beating everybody into submission, which is of course, exactly the opposite of what happens in Maori and in most of the Arthur, where there are long and bloody battles establishing him as king right at the beginning. Um, so the way in which he was emphasizing the law at the beginning, and then of course it comes back, you know, in the end with the, uh, with the almost burning of Guinevere uh, as well. So that was another thing I thought was done really well. Uh, and certainly with the whole might and right question uh, was, was I thought handled really interestingly thematically um, in how they, yeah. in the context of all of this discussion of violence without actual perpetration of violence. Now, Veronica makes a really good point here in the questions that I was kind of thinking about too. She says, I think that the audience is supposed to assume that Arthur dies in the battle after the last scene. And furthermore, the last scene is so gloomy and everybody's crying and there's all this like fog in the background. And I picture a battlefield just absolutely strewn with corpses right behind them, even if the camera never shows it. So even while we're emphasizing Arthur's focus on law, I don't think we want to downplay the tragedy of the final battle, which is implied, you know, and then hinged in that like everybody's going to die. And that's why it's important that young Tom has to run away and save his life so he can tell the story. Right. right. Implied, though, again, to me, very interesting. That, I mean, but I think important that it's kept in the background. Right. I mean, you don't you don't see you are invited maybe to imagine it. Right, but you're left to imagine it. The film doesn't doesn't show us that. I mean, what we get is, yeah, we get like the three of them having their final conversation in the gloom and mist and fog and tears shed and and everything else, right? But it's and and then you know his discussion with you know Tom the young archer, but um, but again, we do, we don't, you know there's no nobody gets impaled, you know. Yeah, we don't have a double impaling scene. No, we don't get an impaling scene. Not not even like, one impalement it occurred. Like Which Star Trek movie is it when Picard and his clone son do the Arthurian ending? Oh, right. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. Wait, yeah. I'm forgetting. I'm forgetting which one it is now, but yes. Anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm going to um, jump way ahead in the slideshow here. If Curtis, who's running our slides for us, can um, go to... Um, I think it's slide 11. Um, it's the one with all the candles because I feel like this is on theme. Um, I don't think that they ever, correct me if I'm wrong, this one, I don't think they ever use the phrase, they, they don't talk explicitly about the candle in the, in the film, but they do, you know, White does in the book. So, you know, there's this um, idea of uh, from the candle in the wind is the final book or unless you count the Book of Merlin. Um, uh, Thomas, my idea of those nights was a sort of candle like these ones here. I have carried it for many years with a hand to shield it from the wind. It has flickered often. I am giving you the candle now. You won't let it out. It will burn. Good Tom, the light bringer. So, and yeah. even though they don't, you know, explicitly talk about the candles, you know, at least a couple times we get this candle imagery um, during Arthur and Guinevere's wedding. And then again, when, uh, the the love triangle is kind of threatening things, and Guinevere kind of is has her candle that she could kind of blow out any second if she uh, should choose. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, maybe like anything else, you guys want to talk about to this theme of like the candle, how precious civilization is, and how sort of tenuous it is, <laughs> and and all the forces that are threatening to kind of you know stamp that out at any moment. Yeah, there's a lot of talk about civilization in, in this film. Um, and actually that scene with the candles when they're being married, I, that was the first moment and I thought, oh, actually this film could be really good um, because I just had the kind of frolicking scene in the woods with the snow, which seems to last about an hour. And it seems <laughs> to be filmed in someone's garage, sort of Julia Margaret Cameron style. Probably um, was. Incredibly stagey. Um, and, you know, one is reminded of Camelot. It's only a model, <laughs> because it is clearly a model. Um, when he says, um, "Oh, in my youth, the Camelot was 
everything was pink and was then pink. the model yes. <laughs> Merlin, uh, Merlin and left and took the pink with him that line really <laughs> exactly <was> exactly <laughs> it's not the high point and then <laughs> and then you realize that they just obviously ran out of money when they did that scene um because they spent it all on the amazing sets and um splendor of the rest of the film and that scene with all the is on the rather battle beautiful too right <laughs> yeah um, sorry uh but but then also it's a reference back to the origins of this film, which is a Broadway play. And I was looking on YouTube and there's, um, uh, I don't think there's any footage from the actual um, original run, but there is footage of um, Julie Andrews and Richard Burton singing. Um, but I think that's probably from a later sort of when they got the, the band back together and they sort of um, did a kind of cheaper set, perhaps. I'm not quite sure. Um, but certainly, you know, it, it has this origin in the Broadway play. And obviously you can't show violence very easily in Broadway play. You can't have a big battle. Um, and in fact, I believe that the um, jousting scene, which is the one bit of kind of exciting violence we get in the film, was told in the Broadway play as a song. Um, so, you know, if you're sticking to the play, then you can't really show the big battles, even if you wanted to. But then it, as you've been saying, it fits beautifully with T.H. White, who um, actually isn't really interested in these big battles. Um, just like, uh, by the way, Lewis and Tolkien, you know, he, they, they always sort of pull away when we get to the big battles. I mean, they don't sort of spend pages and pages on these um, these things. They're not really kind of what these authors are interested in. But what White does do um, is make fun of uh, that kind of knightly prowess and uh, uh, fighting um, in The Sword and the Stone with um, Pelennor. Um, a, a, having a fight with another knight and um, uh, falling over all the time. And you sort of get that in the film as well uh, with Pelennor, who forgets who he's king of, you know, what country he's from and so on. So it's kind of making fun of um, that whole kind of um, chivalric romance um, background. But at the same time, you, you, you then go back at the end of the film to this, I think, very moving scene um, and this idea that storytelling is important and that's what you're supposed to take away from it at the end not the fighting and the bloodshed um, yeah. or the even the pageantry um, of King Arthur's reign but the story the fact that he tried to do something good the fact that he tried to turn uh, might into right um, and I did find that that seemed quite moving um, shed a tear or two it's not uh, we don't have the uh, language of the candle in the wind we don't also have it's explicitly said that this is Thomas Mallory, which I think is a bit of a shame. Mm. Yes. Um, incidentally, I think it's 550 years since Le Morte d'Arthur was completed. There was a, there's a conference on at Nova Scotia as, as we speak all about this. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, um, you know, for people who've read the book, uh, I think that scene is very moving because, you know, oh, it's, it's, it's to Tommy M. It's it's Thomas Mallory, and and I know what, and I know the significance of the the candle imagery and so on and so forth. So that was rather lovely. Going back to what you were saying about the battles and the tournaments and so forth, T. H. White calls that out specifically when he's moving up to an exciting battle moment. He'll stop and be like, "If you want to read about that, go read Mallory. He's already given you all the details." Yeah. <laughs> and yet, then sometimes he does that great trick, which authors love, which is sometimes he'll then he'll then tell it anyway. Right. right. Like, and I mean, Craig, film, but sometimes he'll skip it. Yeah. I mean, Mallory loves the lists. He loves going into details about Sir Sycamore smoked down Sir Dunedin, oh, blah, 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 blah. Um, but um, I mean, Cressy de Tois, another medieval Arthurian writer, doesn't go into any of that at all. He says, you know, I could describe this battle, but it would be too boring. So I'm, I can't be bothered. <laughs> And he moves on. So it's not just T.H. White, but uh, um, it, it, yeah, I mean, it is interesting. I mean, even Mallory's battles are quite, I mean, he's more interested in the names than he is in the actual fighting, I would say. Yes. Whereas one of the distinguishing features of um, Tolkien's Arthur is that it's almost all military. It's almost all fighting mm -hmm. from beginning to end. It's, it's quite dark. That's true. Sorry, That's true. Sorry, Corey. Yeah. You want to go on that? Like on this idea of of maybe the lack of violence, even though it fits with um, the theme, is still maybe a a relic of being translated between stage to film. Um, what what do you guys think of that translation? Like it seems to me, from what I've 
you know, been reading that um, uh, the stage play seems to be a little more highly regarded than the movie. It seems like the legacy of, of this show is largely in the music and the original Broadway cast recordings and that sort of thing. And the, and the movie actually got kind of mixed reviews, I think because of some of that staginess um, and that maybe they didn't do enough to translate it into cinema. Um, there's, I think somebody in the, in the questions kind of asked like, they had all these fabulous Broadway actors, why didn't they use them? Um, so some of the performances were a little bit criticized. Um, uh, I, I think Franco Nero doesn't even do his own singing, which I only recently found out. Um, so I don't know, what do you guys think in terms of like that translation? Um, I mean, we, we know Gabriel pointed out the, the very uh, stage bound nature of the opening but did you guys feel like that throughout? Um, what was there, your sense of how it worked as a movie? There were definitely moments when I found myself being reminded of it. I mean, like for just to cite one really odd little example in that, um, in that, that discussion that they were having with the map and stuff near the beginning when uh, both of them are, that is Arthur and Guinevere were both naked throughout most of that discussion. She was, wrapped in a sheet going about the room wrapped in a sheet and then he is in the bath the bath that they kind of trundle out on we wheels. Were out in the bath. yes yeah. which was which was by far the most like st you know uh stage play ish prop in the entire thing and i'm like who would do that in a film like who would who would put a tub on wheels and wheel it in from off stage like you're doing a movie you can have a tub and just pan to the tub if you want to do that and I love it. His, his guys are just waiting behind the curtain for him <laughs> yeah, to get with into the, the, the tub, and tub right for him to pop so he disappears off screen, still singing or talking. I can't remember exactly which was happening. And then in they wheel him in with the tub. That was one of the moments where I was like, okay, right. That's right. It was a state. I, I guess we're still remembering our state, you know, our, 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 our Broadway, you know, uh, production of this. So there were a few moments like that, that fe felt to me really weird. Um, but other than that, uh, I mean, it, it was, uh, I mean, it's hard because I know people who, you know, who do, I mean, I, I, I hear your cat's always been my understanding too, that the, the original Broadway, uh, uh, play was, 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 you know, more powerful than the film and, and more, uh, uh, more, more, um, uh, I know Arthur was just saying, you know, what what a tragedy he felt it was that they felt they had to recast it, that they didn't just use the the Broadway cast for um, yeah. uh, for the film. And I, you know, I hear that. I really wonder how it might have been different had you know the 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 dynamics of that original production been kind of translated. Maybe it would have been worse. Maybe it would have been better. I don't know. But um, but yeah, it's it, it, it. I'm not sure that the to to what kind of an extent that kind of an in, invisible middle figure right because we have we have the film and you know i i'm thinking about the film as an adaptation of th white of sir thomas mallory and these other things right but there's this there's this almost invisible central term right that is the the stage play uh which this is really coming through and so trying to figure out um, the extent to which that is being used as a medium and it's kind of passing through that. It's, it's kind of hard for me to piece together knowing very little about the, uh, the original stage play. But even not knowing much about the stage play, there are some moments that creak and rattle as a, as a film. I mean, there are ways in which it's not just the most perfect film, right? That, that, doesn't, yeah. that doesn't produce my love of it, but it's really overacted. It's so melodramatic. I just watched again before the clip when Arthur gives this speech alone in the dark near the round table and he finally knows for sure that Lancelot and Guinevere are having an affair. And he's like, I'm going to punish them. You know, I need a man's revenge. And he says, oh, but I'm a king. It just, I mean, it's it's such bad ham acting. It's, you know, it's like some kind of high school actor. I have no idea if that has to do with the translation from the stage to the screen. Uh, did those same actors also perform it on stage or did they only do the film? No, they only, the, they, they only did the. They only did the film, film. I think. I, and I, I think um, I think Richard Harris did it later on stage. He did a revival of the stage play, which was successful. Um, but these weren't the. They didn't I, import any of the stage actors. That's not their excuse. Then they're not trying to like ham it up because they're on a little stage in front of a big audience. <laughs> but there are other yeah. elements that are really stagey, like really bad backdrops, and you know, very few sets and 
not a lot of traversing between them in a sort of a naturalistic right one way. one exception to that which I don't know if it works or not because the fact that I'm noticing it makes me gives me pause as to whether how successful it was but one that definitely felt like there's an attempt to translate this to a different medium is um, Lancelot's Say Moi um, which I found a very um, amusing song this time and how each time it cuts to a different verse, he's in a different place. place. I love this idea that he's singing this the whole way. The whole um, time, it's, yes, it's, exactly. He's singing about himself. And <laughs> each verse, he's, he's in his castle, and then they're, in, they're on a boat crossing the channel, and then they're at a campfire, and then they're riding their horses, and each time it's a different verse about how wonderful and pure and, and special and incomparable he is. And, and if anybody can do it, it's me. So um, I... I even though it was kind of, I, I, I like the over the topness of it. So that that scene kind of stuck out for me as something you wouldn't do on stage. You would have him just in his castle singing about how great he is. But here they kind of show him having that journey and doing it the whole way. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of comments from the audience on these points. Our, our listeners are pretty passionate about this. <laughs> yes, <laughs> they are. Great. And then they also bring in some of the like, adaptation choices, which maybe we could then go to talking about specific things that are put in or left out. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, so Arthur says, young Dumbledore has only one facial expression through the whole film. So I don't know if we want to go back to our first slide. Is there anything else to that we wanted to say about um, Arthur, specifically or Richard Harris, before we kind of transition to a different topic here? Um, or any of the other central performances, you know, we could talk about Guinevere and Lancelot as well. I don't get why he, he's got blue eyeshadow for half the film. <laughs> Killer and eyeliner. Well, it's, yeah, I mean, I didn't get the blue eye, eye, eye um, eyelids. Uh, and then he, he loses that. I mean, it, there is a problem with um, any kind of film adaptation of King Arthur in that it, if you show a different actor if if you want to show Arthur at the start of his reign and Arthur at the end of his reign, um, then you, you usually end up with the same actor um, having to play very young at the start and then very old at the end. Um, and it sometimes looks a bit weird. So um, that scene actually in the forest, I think actually Richard, um, what's his name, Richard Harris? Mm -hmm. uh, is that his name? Yeah. Young Dumbledore is all I can think of now. <laughs> anyway, yeah, Richard <laughs> Harris um, plays that quite well. Um, but it, but it is a problem. I mean, the the, uh, the other one to look at is John Borman's Excalibur, uh, where um, the, the uh, actor who plays Arthur not only changes his um, characterization but also his accent um, when he's a young man. Uh, but um, I think yeah, Richard Harris does that quite well as a young man, and then he's sort of maybe less good as a, as an old man. He does a lot of Merlin, where are you? I mean, this is the same actor who gave us. Harry Potter, it was love, Harry. You know, there's it's, it's not like a lot of kind of going on there with that performance. Um, but then again, uh, I think that line, Serena, you, you mentioned, uh, I'm not a man, I'm a king. That actually gets the heart of T.H. White's portrayal of King Arthur. And I think it's quite unique um, to, to White. And he does it incredibly well. Um, if you look at someone like Tennyson, you know, he, he tries to sort of make out that Arthur is a man, uh, you know, I, real manhood in ideal man in real manhood, I think he says. Um, but he doesn't really get that across. Um, with White, you kind of get this real sense of tussle um, and torment in his Arthur that he is split between his duty as a as a king and his kind of personal yeah. visual. Yeah. In a in a humanity, I suppose, and I did see that come across with Richard Harris, um, but it it's difficult to get that across in a film, actually, uh, and I think that's something a novel does better. Um, and then there were other points where I think the play would have done things better. I think there was some comments here um, that uh, Mordred turns up, and then the next thing you know, everyone's fighting each other on the table. The same mm. thing with Guinevere and Lancelot. They look at each other. The next scene, they're declaring their love for each other. And it seems like something's missing in the DVD extras, you know, some deleted scene where you actually uh, get that character development. I know you a few songs were missing. First sight. Sorry? Well, yeah, you don't no, I, love at first sight? I felt exactly uh, well, the same way. 
it's not i mean it, but to me it wasn't it wasn't even so much like that they fell in love at first sight it's that like arthur is like completely uh, they exchange a glance he sees them exchange a glance and everything's over it's like a glance has been exchanged everything is, <laughs> and he's having these long things i was i was amazed i mean my my, my, my pr probably my single biggest impression uh watching through this time was how incredibly slowly the film seems to seem to proceed in some places uh yeah. and yet how incredibly fast the plot was moving you know it, despite you know so oh my god it's been like an hour and a half and yet blam like the love interest like like we we escalated from you know i hate lance a lot and i think he's dumb you know to like crisis and we're in love with each other and arthur knows and everything in like 10 minutes that happened you know so yeah i definitely was feeling um especially given the the kind of lassitude into which i had lapsed over the first hour and a half of the film um with just like the pace of things and i'm not i don't mean that as a criticism it was it was delicious in some ways but uh but then all of a sudden i'm like whoa hang on i'm i'm not i'm not i'm not, I'm not even keeping up anymore what's going on um, uh, Curtis, will you go to the next slide? Because I think we can kind of also talk about Guinevere and Lancelot a little bit here too. Um, yeah, it's, it is it is weird how in some ways this film luxuriates in a lot of things and the things that it does well, it does really well and spends time on it. And then, but it, it it's kind of unbelievable how much gets left out of a three hour movie. Yes. Um, and yes. The, so the pacing can be very, imbalanced at times there's a lot of like you know slow and then fast and then slow and then fast um and maybe i don't know like do you so i'm thinking of what gabriel said about his very different impression just reading the lyrics of the songs and versus when you have read the book or or seen i mean the book of the play or seen the movie i'm wondering if there's like a disjunct between the songs the content of the songs which are very much like we're going to drill down on one idea for a long time versus yep. the the book, you know, the script, which is trying to pack, you know, hundreds of pages or how many generations of tradition into very short little transitional scenes. And I don't know if is there some kind of friction between the two there. Yeah, and that's what that's what songs frequently do. Of course, you can have narrative songs that move the plot forward, like the one when Guinevere goes through the different nights and asks them to take her to the fair and do this and that and the thing as long as they promise to kill Lancelot. So, you know, she's actually recruiting these three or four guys to do something. Without that song, we'd be missing plot. But others are like what we call a suitcase aria in the history of opera, which is it's um, it it freezes time and it gives the audience a glimpse of the inner emotional state of the character. And so it's, it's just like one emotional condition. So they called them suitcase arias because like this diva would have this certain aria that expresses anger and that she'd be so good at that one that they'd pop it into a different opera when they're like, oh, the character's angry now. And so she would like carry just these certain arias around with her in her suitcase from play to play Interesting. <laughs> exactly you just drop them in so there is a certain sense in which sometimes time stops when there's a song it's not moving things forward yeah and by the way that's uh 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 cat what i love so much about the same wah song because on the one hand, that's what we're getting, right? We're getting like this frozen moment in time where Lancelot is telling us about himself, except as you say, it's not a frozen moment. It's like continuously as he travels all the way across. So it's it's like he you know he, he pulls that out of his out of his suitcase daily, right? For weeks and weeks and exactly. weeks. Exactly. Uh, yeah. A little so, bit of obsessive thinking in that guy, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but uh, uh, but no, yeah, no, no, good point that the songs were so widely known before the movie came out that they were pretty much required, right? The movie's trying sure. to bring the Broadway show to the masses. So like, you've got to sing the songs, even if they slow the plot down or speed it right. up in jerks or whatever. And from a pop culture point of view, I think that's what this show was very much known for, certainly in its time and in the legacy was like, what's the score? You know, I don't think audiences were necessarily coming to it to see how are they going to adapt Sir Thomas Mallory's story. They're there for the songs, you know, or at least if you're going to, you know, you can sneak Arthur past those watchful dragons, but that's not like what people are buying their ticket for, I guess. Right. right. Can we dig down now into some of the specific 
yeah, addition or it. omissions. Um, there's a like. line about Mordred, isn't there? Yeah, he's in a couple slides, I think. We can talk about the omission Next of the one. grail. Uh, one after that. There we go. Yeah, so here's a, a list of some of the things that are missing. No Morgaz or incest, no Orkney feuds, no Gawain or Gareth, no grail. This, this, <laughs> this, was, this was my takeaway when I saw this movie at 15 or whatever it was. So yeah, interested to hear your thoughts about that. Um, a lot of, I think Arthur Harrow's pointed out um, that um, Mordred has a scene in the stage play that was cut, um, and this actor was actually a very highly trained singer, so that was unfortunate. And he was introduced in a slightly different way, and they cut things. So, like, I don't know, maybe this character was undercut a bit more than it already was by the omission of these other plot elements and everything. I forget where Mordred comes from in the movie. Like nowhere. Who's his, like, who's his nowhere. parents? He just shows up and is like, "Hi, yeah. I'm Mordred. I'm coming." We don't to know who he, who his parents are or anything. Yeah, Morg Morgies and and Arthur. He he oh. is the, the bastard son. It's just narrated. Uh, he just tells us later. Uh, uh, Arthur, Arthur. Yeah, they, they have a conversation. I mean, um, uh, he's introduced as the man from Scotland. Uh, and then he says he comes down from Orkney from Princess Moggies, um, and uh, she apparently um, came across Arthur as a young man and sought comfort or something like that. But it, it's not, of course, it's not said that Moggies is any relation to Arthur. They don't go for the incest. Okay. Right. Of course, White barely tells it too. He tells it really roundabout and just yeah. Well, set. I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. I was just kind of looking at the end of of that book too and. Um, I'll find you the passage. There's a whole paragraph about how it's, he sits you down and says, now it's really important for later that you understand that Arthur slept with his sister. So just so we're all clear, <laughs> um, I'm gonna find you that paragraph. Yeah, I'm looking for it too. Somebody else. I mean, while you guys are looking for the, for the passage, I will just say, I mean, oh, yeah. I, I said that uh, Mordred came from nowhere because that was my feeling just, I mean, in the film. Like yeah. all of a sudden, like pop, there's this guy. And I, I, you know, just watching this film again, again, it had been years. I was like, wait, who is that guy? Like, who's, who's this guy and why has he appeared? And I, I you know, learned who he was. Oh, look, it's Mordred. Um, but why had he appeared? Uh, was like not, comp anyway, it, he was, um, he was sort of rather out of nowhere um, and plays a really interesting kind of foil to Arthur, right? Instead of being, you know, the rival that, you know, we see, you know, the, I mean, he, he was, I mean, the way he kind of insinuates himself is like a little bit Mordred like, but the role that he plays is, was just struck me as, as very odd mm. uh, in, in the context of like the, the larger Arthurian tradition. I mean, uh, the, 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 the role that, I mean, you know, maybe in part I am, um, you know, biased. I've been doing some C.S. Lewis rereads lately. So thinking about like, you know, the conceptual role that Lewis saw Mordred playing in the Arthurian court uh, what is kind of what's been in my head. And that's so far from what Mordred was in this film. Um, you know, the kind of, uh, he was just so sidekicky in the film mm. that it, it was, it felt really strange to me. I mean, like it's Mordred, has got to if he's not himself like the central villain he has to be connected with villainy you know rather than i mean there was there was an element of like him bringing things out of arthur right and him being almost in a kind of tempter figure in some sense it you know it, but i don't know it was uh i i found his character one of the strangest um uh in in just one of the strangest storytelling choices I felt mm -hmm. in the whole film. Yeah, yeah. he's a scallywag um, yes. rather than a, sort of a villain. Um, and I think that that's a, an issue with tone. Uh, I, 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 there's a huge issue with tone with The Once Future King anyway, because it starts with the, the Sword in the Stone, which is fun. And then it goes very, very dark. And the publishers, um, Bill Collins, did not like that. And, and T.H. White struggled to get this published and then made a lot of changes, rewrote the second book to make it less dark, uh, had a bit more of King Arthur in it. 
Um, but I think this is something that the makers of Camelot were struggling with as well. Is this a fun fantasy adventure? Is this escapism, whatever escapism means? Um, or is this kind of the dark tragedy? Um, and, and is Mordred a, a serious villain or is he just sort of um, causing trouble? Um, I think there are hints actually I, I, that uh, that Mordred has a point. Um, he's a kind of, in the kind of Hegelian sense of tragedy where it's like two opposing rights come, mm. coming into conflict with each other. Mordred kind of, you know, he, he's right about Lancelot and Guinevere and um, he's right to expose hypocrisy, I suppose, mm -hmm. one might argue. But then that's not really um, followed through. And I don't think it's at all clear what his motivation is um, or really what he's doing at the end because my understanding of the end of the film is that Arthur's about to fight Lancelot's people, which doesn't really quite make sense because he just talked to Lancelot. I don't think he's about to fight Mordred, unless I misunderstood that, although that is obviously where we're leading up to if we know the legend. But that's, mm -hmm. you know, Mordred isn't really the kind of great villain who wants to take over yeah. in this story. Exactly. Right, and, and again, a question of genre, Gabriel, we should, we should maybe come back to that. Sorry, Kat. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I was just going to say, and without um, the whole Orkney feud thing, that undercuts why Arthur is fighting Lancelot to begin with. That, you know, there, there's not this element of right. of the revenge storyline that needs yeah, to be we happening. Have to we can't have his tragic death be one of the dividing wedges. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Which, uh, which for me, in, in terms of that kind of... Um, Hegelian version of, of the tragedy, as Gabriel was saying, was what was so powerful to me was this everybody's wrong and everybody's right kind of scenario of, mm -hmm. of the, the tragedy is inevitable because um, not because it's good versus evil necessarily, but it's kind of, you know, morally gray or mostly good people who are at each other's throats for understandable reasons. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's a lot thornier, thornier than that. Um, so yes, mm. I, I found my passage, by the way. Um, right. where at the end of book two, um, he says that uh, it is the, so he shares the family tree and then kind of tells you to look at it and says that um, it is the tragedy, the Aristotelian and comprehensive tragedy of sin coming home to roost. This is why we have to take note of the parentage of Arthur's son Mordred and to remember when the time comes that the king had slept with his own sister. He did not know he was doing so, and perhaps it may have been due to her, but it seems in tragedy that innocence is not enough. Yeah. So I think he makes it like, certainly when I read it, like I think that's pretty explicit. And so watching this for the first time, those were the things that jumped out to me is how much yeah. of that storyline is just completely plucked out from the story entirely. And it right. seems like the tragedy is all about the love triangle, um, rather than also being about a few other factors as well. Now, um, you're ex exactly right, Kat. Um, what I was thinking of when I said he really skips over it is like, there's no scene, you know, there's no like several chapters of Morgoth's. Oh, sure. Um, it's one page and like, there's no sex scene. Now that's probably right. because of where he is and having this book grow up from a kid's book into a grown-up book, right? Yeah. But he just says it is impossible to explain how these things happen. Perhaps it was because of this, because of that. But whatever the reason, nine months later, she had a baby by her half-brother. Sure. And, right, but, right. From that point of view, it's not yeah. explicit. So, it's, not, it's not graphic. It's not... Right. It's, that's it's, it's a bit more like the movie that later on we're like, oh, this Mordred guy. Right. Where did he come from? Right. And and that passage, Serena, is where the first edition ends. So um, I'm I'm going to do that thing where wow. I hold it up to the camera and no one can oh, see it. So it was called yeah. Mordred. And then you have this weird kind of um, drawing of a card, an ace by White, and then the whole thing ends. Then um, in the first edition, this is the first edition of Thorns Future King. He adds he adds that whole. Um, oh, so it ends thing. with the sentence. It was called Mordred, not with. Yeah, you know, exactly. Ah. So he adds he adds this whole. Um, uh, family tree, and then this whole explanation. Now, this is referencing something he um, wrote about in his journal right at the start, before he even wrote the um, the Sword in the Stone. He uh, did his dissertation on Mallory for his undergraduate degree at Queen's Cambridge, um, and then he reread Mallory um, back when he, uh, I think this was after he quit his job as um, 
English teacher at Stowe and uh, decided he was going to become a writer and he reread Mallory and he realized two things as he notes in his journal. One is that the whole thing is a perfect Aristotelian tragedy with complete mm. whole with a beginning, middle and end. He thinks this is very important. The second thing is that Mallory was trying to find an antidote to war. More. Now, both of these things can be disputed, but this is what um, T.H. White thought. And so my feeling with this is that when he rewrote The Queen of Air and Darkness, well, he, it's The Witch and the Wood in the, the first edition, and then he retitles it. Um, and he rewrote it for The Once and Future King. He thought, this is my last chance to, to get this point across, but also I want to make this... Um, I want to make this work in this kind of very this much larger story I'm telling. Um, the witch in the woods. It, it doesn't need it, if it's treated as a standalone book. It's a bit weird to go into all that detail. But if you're seeing this in the context of a four or five part um, omni book, then it does make sense to give this kind of broader idea. Um, and so, if you're thinking about Camelot as a film, because it's so standalone. Um, maybe we don't need all that stuff because we're not going into the kind of the whole Aristotelian tragedy of the story. Um, and also, um, just on the point of kind of not seeing the sex, I was reminded of the Sam Neill Merlin version where we do see the sex, but it's in the candle wax because that's the only way they could get away with showing sex is if it was kind of magical candle wax having sex. And it sounds bizarre, but if you've seen the, the, the film, you'll know what I mean. Um, so you can you can do it's it. Like, um, like voodoo, it's like voodoo sex or something? <laughs> uh, no, no, it's real sex, but Merlin sees it in candle wax. Does that um, make sense? Yeah. A few people in the in the question said that they hadn't heard of this miniseries with Sam Neill. So I'm going to share in the questions the link yeah, to the Wikipedia page or whatever so people can go look it up. You should check it out. Yeah, yeah Helen and Bonham Carter is in it as um, uh, Morgan Le Fay. And, and J James Earl Jones is what pops up as the um, the voice of the mountain or something like that. It's it's a bit of a weird cast, but yeah, and Sam Neill. And Short, like... Moment. Oh, mm. put Martin Short in your Arthurian movie. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Can we go to slide 13 then and talk about genre? Is that okay? Since we, we started out by talking about the ending, we keep coming back to talking about the ending. Um, so at the end, I think we have a question about, like, is it a happy or a sad ending, right? So he wanted it to be an Aristotelian tragedy, but is it anymore? I mean, is it a happy ending? Is it a sad ending? And what genre is the book? And what genre is the film? I mean, the book is such a gallimaufry, right? Like, it's not only different genres in the different volumes of it, but like it changes tone so drastically, even within passages. And it's got all different styles of writing, all different techniques cobbled together. Um, what does that end up doing for the, for the movie then? Like, is, is it more coherent than the book? Does it... A more consistent. Well, that's actually one of the things I kind of thought was good about Richard Harris was that he seems to combine that real heart-rending, you know, man with deep emotions, but also that very playful and kind of stupid guy that Arthur mm -hmm. is in the book. He's not a real deep thinker, but when he thinks about something, you know, then he's committed to it and he's he's going to carry through his kingly duty. He but, thinks about it really hard. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Takes, it takes him a while. <laughs> his thought Proposition. Yeah. 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 Right. And he's always going back to Merlin's lessons from his childhood. Right. Um, but the, the movie feels to me a bit more, well, I don't want to say coherent because that's like a judgment one way then, but the movie feels to me to be more one thing than the books. And it seems to be more pushing towards the inevitable pain of the end of the story more than the book, perhaps. Well, um, and of course, we have to remember the way that the film frames it by starting at the ending, right? I mean, it starts with Arthur in the darkness and the fog by himself, to think talking explicitly about how everything has fallen apart and we're just told like, okay, Lancelot and Guinevere are in that castle over there and they've betrayed you. So we get the tragic, we start with the tragic ending, right? And then he's like, okay, so remember back to the beginning and, and Serena, as you say, what does he do? He immediately thinks back to Merlin and his childhood and then Merlin's like, no, not that far back. Too right? far <laughs> back. <laughs> and then he remembers.
when he met Guinevere and we start the story. But of course, we, we, you know, so when we come to the end and when we come to the gloomy, long face, darkness, fog uh, and everything at the end, it's where we started. Right. So in that way, it's certainly more unified uh, as a story. Um, you know, it's framed to be unified in that way, though. I don't when it comes to the question of tragedy. This is where I'm finding myself missing corpses again, though. Because I, I you just want more dead bodies. I, I wanted more dead bodies. It's it would be a little clearer for me. I mean, it's like okay, like it's because th that felt to me like a I don't know, like like we wanted it to be a tragedy, but we weren't really committed to the concept. You know, like like what's a tragedy in which nobody dies? Isn't that I mean, almost sadder though, Corey? When you still are seeing the living people that you love, and they like walk off screen to die, doesn't that hurt you more than when you just see a corpse lying there? Well, I I no? mean, <laughs> no. Miss <laughs> Morgan's necromancy school days. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's just she found that nunnery she went to, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I guess it just that there are nunneries and then there are nunneries, I suppose. But, uh, uh, but I don't know. I mean, it's um, and that was the other. Th I mean, and here, of course, I was just reflecting a lot. The the end, like the parting scene and everything, right? I was reflecting a lot about the parting scenes at the end of Mallory, right? And like there's you lose something when you don't have anybody viewing anybody's corpse. Like, it's not that I need them to die, but at the, I mean, the, the, the kind of impact that Mallory gets out of for Lancelot, Guinevere and Arthur, right? The kind of impact that, that, uh, that, that, that Mallory gets out of the contemplation of, of their deaths and that, and even in Lancelot's case, especially the viewing of their corpses, right? It's really, it's a big deal. And uh, this just, I, I don't know. It felt a little mamby pamby to me. I just like I couldn't really, uh, I, I I couldn't feel the tragedy nearly as much because we were like, all right, we're just like saying goodbye and everybody's still, you know, in reasonably good health and we're going off stage and probably dying. But um, anyway, I, I don't know. It just um, I felt like that you know there wasn't that same. It, it, it just, I don't know, it just didn't hit, maybe it's me, but it didn't hit me as hard. Um, that sense of, that sense of loss, you know, the, the, the sense of, of everything. I don't know. Um, I mean, well, I, I, sorry, Arthur go on. Said that, well, Arthur, Arthur Harrow says that he votes sad ending because he always gets misty. And I think Gabriel, did you say you just watched it and, and felt the same? So maybe do you want to give the, the uh, no, I, I was, but, I, I I did cry at the end, but I was I was crying because um I was so moved to see uh Sir Thomas Mallory in there and to see that that one of my favorite scenes in the Once Future King actually depicted on screen, um and actually that great sense of hope I find at the end of Once and Future King when um Arthur rises up, um in fact I mean let's look at that last it's a wonderful passage and they I think the last few lines you know, the cannons of his adversary were thundering in the tattered morning when the majesty of England drew himself up to meet the future with a peaceful heart. I mean, that's just, that—that that is the ending I get from Camelot as well. And I was not expecting that because that's a beautiful bit of literature. Um, and I think it is um, represented very well. I, but I do agree with you, Corey. Um, there aren't very many bodies. I believe there was supposed to be about 80 knight killed. I think someone mentions this in the film. Aureus Lancelot's rescued Guinevere, but killed 80 knights. I'm not quite sure how he managed to do that because it was all very quick. And then you see a kind of fleeting sort of crane shot glance at some twitching bodies. Um, but then if you think back to the uh, early part of the film when Lancelot is so distraught because he thinks he's killed Sir Dinadan, and he has, and, and then he says, please, please, make him live and it and it's it's such a close-up um and the actors are so close to each other it must have been a very weird is his scene. face probably you can see sir Dinadan's lips are like mushed yeah like this i mean they, they kiss it's yes, this they're, they're literally mouth to mouth, mouth he's breathing into his mouth um, yeah and and you don't get that in in the end like lancelot presumably doesn't care that much by that point but <laughs> you know if you know the source material i mean the, i mean who dies in this scene i mean agravain i think um uh, uh gareth i think or does gawain die um 
he gets his, yeah. his head wound, I think. So, you know, some yeah. pretty yeah, important... Yeah. yeah, some pretty important people die who are, are good friends of Lancelot, and they and the film doesn't linger on this. Uh, Serena, you, you wanted to say something? Me, me! <laughs> yeah, but remember <laughs> what we said at the beginning when we were talking about the trailer? We said this is really much more of a love story than a war story. Yeah. So the real tragedy... Yeah are the love story tragedies. And the two minutes in the film, the two moments in the film that make me cry the most are not the ending, but the If Ever I Would Leave You song and the um, What Do the Simple Folk Do? Mm. To pick up their hearts when they're blue. Because then you get the different thirds of the love triangle, you know, knowing that they've destroyed each other, they've each destroyed Arthur and they've helped to destroy the kingdom. So the tragedies are the love story tragedies. Now, of course, destroying a kingdom and this like great vision is also pretty sad. But because we had no grail, the stakes are not as high as they are in lots of the other stories. I mean, in Charles Williams' version of it, they postpone the second coming of Christ because the way they mess up. You know, like that's not here. There's not like divine, eternal, metaphysical consequences here. It's just like we tried to set up law and order. That's not going to work. So now we have to have the Dark Ages. Bummer. You know? Yeah. It's not like well, God isn't going to come visit because of what they did. So um, I have a slide on that. Uh, number 12, the one right before this. So um, maybe let's talk about that. Is this, yeah. is this a fantasy story is a question that I have um, because I'm not convinced that it is. So no, yeah, that like, the, maybe that does change the stakes. It's a much more yeah. secular the stakes are more secular. It's less about the fantastic and, and the spiritual, and it's more about the the kingdom and the rule of law and, and oh, those politics, more earthly really. kind of concerns. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Kat, can yeah. you put it in the political context more, either now or later? Can you talk more about, like, the Kennedys and the whole – you hinted at the beginning you wanted to talk about that. Sure. Right. I mean, I'm not, I don't know a ton about it, but um, uh, so uh, JFK was a friend of – learners who I think wrote the book and the lyrics and um, they went to Harvard together. And um, so I guess he stayed in touch and followed him afterward and um, loved the original Broadway cast recording and would play it, you know, before his like, that was his bedtime kind of recording. And so after his assassination, there's a movie called Jackie with Natalie Portman that kind of covers this, that shows the the assassination and, and specifically the aftermath and um, how, at least in the way the film depicts it, and I guess this has been speculated, that she gave this interview with Life magazine where the famous quote came of she um, uh, said that her husband loved that, that story from the show, this is before the movie, and, um, and compared his, she quotes the, the lines about don't let it be forgot that for one brief shining moment, there was a place known as Camelot. And then she says, there won't be another Camelot and put her husband's administration in the context of the, of the, the Camelot story. And kind of, I guess the, the way it's been framed is that she was going out of her way to give a narrative to his legacy and make, to make sure that he wasn't forgotten and was remembered in this very kind of utopian way which it kind of worked like that was the Camelot story and, and the soundtrack became associated with the period of the Kennedy administration. And everything. weren't they even called Camelot even before that? Like when they were in the White I House? I don't think so. I think well, it my, was, it was. My the mother here was just suggesting that. that they were, but. Oh, um, really? Yeah, because yeah. they were you know, they were the youngest and the most beautiful and the most stylish and everyone followed her outfits. And, you know, right. I think right. there was a sense that they were the American royalty uh, yeah my mom says she remembers them being called camelot before his assassination before that okay so, so maybe that that idea was in the air and she kind of solidified it so um yeah but I have a, so, but, but yeah, so I have a question kind of, yeah i have a question for the people who know the stage production because if the stage production was what he was really kind of attached to in his life um because in the film right um the idea like the Camelot business at the beginning during uh, uh, Gabriel's two hour snow scene at the beginning, <laughs> right? With Guinevere, when, uh, when, when, like with, with the pink Camelot off in the distance, 
uh, and that sort of ridiculous song, uh, which I found like actually kind of chilling and horrifying actually about how like, you know, they always order up moonlight at 9 p.m. and like the seasons are not allowed to change and everything. And I'm like, this sounds actually creepy and horrible to me. But anyway, like I get it, like it's supposed to be this whole, this highly idealized thing, but it seemed like in the film mind, it seemed to me very much like, it's not just that this was like an ideal being established, which was going to crumble later on. It was like obviously false from the beginning, right? I mean, the, mm. the way that they set it up as this completely, I mean, literally artificial, right? Like we, we have constructed this little ideal of Camelot. In fact, like it's explicitly untrue. Like he's telling her this in order to win her over, right? And get, you know, so he's spinning this thing, which seemed to be, seemed to be intended by him like for her to understand that this was i mean like it's not like he was lying or trying to deceive her and get her to you know sucker her into believing it right i mean it was this this uh, self-consciously artificial construct of perfection right um so i was thinking about the kennedys concerning which i know almost nothing by the way um i mean I, you know, I've picked up a thing or two here or there just by living in America for all of my life, but I really know almost nothing about the history in that time. Um, but I was, I was wondering about it while I was watching that. And so here's my, back to my question to the people who know the stage production. Is that element, this like the idealized Camelot is a, is like a, a sort of a lovely idea, but it's a fleeting thing that is not really part of this natural world. And, you know, uh, Merlin died and took the pink with him. And and now, you know, there is no pink Camelot anywhere, even from the beginning of the thing. And, we, you know, we, we get the, I felt that the film was, although he has his shining political ideals, right, that he's going to put into place, the, you know, they, they deliberately trot out this very fairy tale sounding version version of Camelot at the beginning in that opening song sequence in the snow, um, which seemed to almost satirize the idea of like fairy tale perfection of the of, of the Arthurian tradition at the beginning. And I found myself wondering about Kennedy at that point. I'm like, so well, yeah, this is, I don't know. That's a fairly sophisticated reading you're giving, though, Corey. Not everyone has read as much Chaucer as you. So no, people like I don't know. Like I, it was... I always took it on at face value as a teenager. Yeah. You know, it's, it, it's well. David is making the really good point that he wasn't trying to tell her anything real about Camelot. He was telling her what kind of person he was. That he's right. An and, 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 and he was being playful. That was how I saw it too. Right. And um, it, but... that's her version too. And she's like, I want right. all these to die for my love. And then when that happens later, it's not so fun. It's not so fun. Exactly. Right. So, but that's, but that, that that's kind that, of my, my, my yeah, I mean, I'm not sure that the movie Camelot is identified with the Kennedys, right? And it's the sixties still, even though, you know, so the film is after his death, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, but it's well, still the, the film 60s. knows that it wouldn't last, but I don't think the film is satirizing or mocking their administration. Well, I would, no, I wouldn't have, so anyway, but this is, this is then what leads then to my question about the play. And the play that the the the, the you know the ver the version that Kennedy knew and loved right of this right of this version of this story right did it have that kind of element at the beginning did we have that I mean uh, is that Arthur, song I was answering your question here okay right. yeah Ar Arthur's saying it was idealistic and represents hope but not necessarily ephemeral. Um, okay, and so he says at the end, Arthur looks back wistfully where once it never rained till after sundown and don't let it be forgot. The metonym, right, for what, that he wants to establish this idealistic kingdom. It's, he doesn't really want it to never rain till after sundown, but he really does want might to only be used in the service of rights. Right, though again, in the film, I would emphasize that that he, that that idea doesn't come to him until, like the, the idea of the fairy tale like the the sort of superficial fairy tale perfection of Camelot comes first, right? It's not a metaphor uh, because the political idea comes second after he's already done his wooing, right? When he and Guinevere are sitting around naked talking about this stuff afterwards, <laughs> like like the you whole do. Thing is remembering, so it could all be colored by. <laughs> okay, fair enough, fair enough. Um, but uh, anyway, I just I just was I I was I was. Uh, I was just really interested in the way that, the, and and so I'm, I, my wondering, especially wanting to contrast it with the play, wishing I could have like seen and contrasted it with the play, um, is you know is there a little bit more kind of bitterness you know in the fairy tale vision 
uh, at the beginning, like in 1967, versus the 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 fairy tale beginning that that might have been there, you know, uh, earlier on in the 60s. Question. Well, yeah, and, and I don't know to what extent I'm sure that the filmmakers were aware of that those associations. Like, how could they not be? So it, yeah. it would be reasonable to think that even if they weren't consciously trying to lace in irony or bitterness, that that might have happened anyway. Just because yeah. if we're associating it with with you know the this more utopian. 1950s and early 60s and now we're in the late 60s and we've got Vietnam and we've got you know civil rights um hap you know movements happening and and riots happening and all that sort of thing um yeah. that they there that's a big um seven years <laughs> it, like that's a very eventful seven year gap between yes. the debut of the of the Broadway show and when the movie's coming mm -hmm. out. Um, yes. So that, that has to have an impact. How could it not? Yeah, and that, that there's that line, um, what's the point of being upper class if you have to fight, if you have to die, um, which which is in white as well, um, but uh, it, it really stood out in that film um, in that context. Uh, the, the, the thing about that kind of, come a lot, da, 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 da. <laughs> Come a lot, come a lot. When you know for five hours, like we get that you're in Camelot. Um, the point of that song for me was 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 about nostalgia because this is all that whole song is taken from a line in T. H. White's The Sword and the Stone when um, White says, "In those days in merry old England, it never rained in the summer. If it had to rain for agricultural reasons, it rained at night." And this is why it kind of, you know, playing around with it, but also playing around with people's ideas of childhood. I don't know about you, but I don't remember the rainy days of my childhood. If, if I do, it was the rainy days when I got to explore some cool house and went into a wardrobe and went into another world. <laughs> exactly. or like that. You know, <laughs> right. and, and White had a horrible childhood. Um, one of his early memories was um, his parents arguing over which one of them was going to shoot the other one first. And they were wrestling over a revolver over his crib. Um, but he sort of he, he wants to have this perfect childhood this, and this kind of um, this childhood where it never rains uh, in the day. Um, and so that's what the song was about for me. Um, but in terms of the ideal of Camelot itself as Arthur's Camelot, um, there's a there's a, a scene where um, someone says um, we don't need to lock our doors anymore. Here's our key. And you do kind of think, well, you, I would hold on to that key if I were you. Um, if you know the Arthurian legend, this is not going to last forever. Um, but then there's another scene later on. In the background, you see all the keys. And in fact, Mordred's in the foreground, and the background is just full of keys. So clearly, everyone has felt safe. Um, and there is a kind of ideal, there's a real idealness to Arthur's realm that he has made everything peaceful um, with his round table. Um, so, you know, there is some kind of biting irony in that film, I think. Um, but yeah. there's also a kind of real, you know, Arthur's kingdom is good. And therefore right. Kennedy's was good, I suppose. Right. So irony in the sense of um, the, the nostalgia and being aware of that, not so much irony in the sense of like satire or, or criticizing the right. idealism. Right. Yeah, except for that line about if you're upper class, you know why? Sure. Why do we fight? Kind of thing. But then that's not really aimed at at Arthur. That's aimed at just you know uh, people who are in Arthur's court. Yeah. Like the Agravain faction, isn't it? Right. Um, hey, can I, I would like to get back to the the fantasy question. We kind of have d yeah. done a sort of a, a, you know a, a, yeah a slight, slight sidetrack there. Um, the to me the most surprising moment in the uh, film. Uh, so my my second most surprising moment in the film is when Mordred shows up and is a like fop out of nowhere. But my first most surprising moment in the film was when uh, he is so Arthur's telling Guinevere about Merlin, right? Who he was and how he grows younger and lives backwards and and everything and 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 was his teacher when he was a boy and stuff and say so, you know and says well do you know how he taught me you know all these things you know he he transformed me into animals. And I was like, okay, all right. Yeah. And then she gives him this look, like, what? And then he's like, 
oh, he made me think I had been an animal. Like he completely naturalizes yeah. it, right? And I'm like, wait, what? Come on yeah. now, <laughs> seriously, we're losing that? Yeah, I mean, the, the, I mean, if we're going to naturalize Merlin, like Merlin is just, he told excellent parables about animals <laughs> To the point where he made me really feel as if I had had an authentic animal experience. And I'm like, for real? That's where we're going with Merlin? Um, yeah, yeah. Like, th and, and so you and don't think that Dinadan was actually dead either? Well, no, character? that to me is then the question though, because I, th we established that closer to the beginning, right? Or at least this, I don't know, it's, it's strange because it's, it's not like Arthur is saying, no, actually, Merlin was totally normal. He was just a little bit, you know, he was like a completely mundane fellow, just a little bit eccentric. You know, he still insists that he lives time backwards and remembers the future and all that kind of thing. And yet, like, but turning into animals, that's a step too far, right? And and he, like, recants the idea that he actually turned into an animal with on, under not so very close questioning from Guinevere <laughs> on that subject. Um, so just the way in which the film seemed to be just kind of really nervous backing away from fantasy elements there. Even the ones which would have been, I would have thought to anybody who knew T.H. White, that, that like the most charming elements, like surely if there's one thing that you, that you like from the ones in Future King, right? It's like the animal bits, right? Mm. That's, 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 you know, anyway, but, but no, they, they, they backed away from that. But then of course, Serena, as you say, we have this moment of the miraculous right which is like the very central like the halfway point of the movie is the is you know almost exactly chronologically halfway through is the miraculous re resuscitation um and or resurrection of dinadin um but i get miraculous it seemed rather than fantastical there's no magic right there might be miracle but there's not magic, and especially Serena, thinking back to your other point, in a film wh which is utterly grailless, right? The fact that we retain, and of course, I was remembering things like the healing of Sir Uri, and the, you know, in uh, you know, at the end of, of of Mallory and everything, where we do get actual miracles associated with Lancelot, not th which are not even grail connected, right? Um, it seemed to be much more that kind of miracle rather than a merlin style you know fantastic but then it sounds thing. like you're arguing that it's not secularized that it's still a miracle due to lancelot's christian piety sort of except he's not very christian uh Pretty arrogant yeah he is um but i don't know it's um I was surprised. I, I I honestly don't know what to do with the sort of miracle scene in the middle. Um, <clears throat> apart from the, I mean, I can see the function of it. Obviously, it's the it's the big emotional turning point for Lancelot and 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 Guinevere's relationship. Oh, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, that's so the role that it plays in the love story is very clear. Um, but the but way. Yeah, I mean, the, the, yeah, it's not the, nearly the role that it plays in White, because in White, this is a through line that Lancelot mm -hmm. can work miracles up until he sins with Elaine and then Guinevere, and then he loses his miracle making power, and then he's not allowed to achieve the Grail because of it, and then he holds to a life of piety for years and years afterwards. Well, and, um, and in White, he he that's the thing he wants most in the world is to perform a miracle. That's like his, yeah. His, until he kind of, you know, meets Guinevere and, and that changes things to a certain extent, like that's his right. life purpose. Um, so that's White like a, a culminating thing, moment for him. Yeah. Yeah. And why does I, I have to, I have to agree. Oh, sorry, Serena, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, in white, it's not a love triangle. It's a quadrangle because it goes on and on about for Lancelot, God is a person and he's, has this love relationship with God, and you know he's unfaithful to both Arthur and to God, but he's with Guinevere and blah blah. And then of course there's Elaine, so it's really a five-sided pentagon there. Right. Mm. And in, yeah. in White, um, his theory—I don't think this is in the book, but in his journal, he talks about Lancelot as being bisexual. I mean, he's genuinely in love with with Arthur, which isn't quite. I mean, there is that scene in Camelot the movie where um, Arthur says, uh, "If I could have imagined anyone 
I'd like to be with, it would be Lancelot and Guinevere, but uh, Lancelot is framed as a brother rather than the lover. Right, brother or right. Son, the, the hero yeah. worship is right. the yeah. hero worship still there, but not the mm -hmm. sexual dynamic. Yeah. 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 So I, I mean, I, I kind of took it as, I think, for the same reason as Corey, I questioned the the supernatural aspect of the healing because of the removal of all the other, like you know, I, I you know, I was thinking like, there's no Grail, there's no, we get Pelinor, but we get no Questing Beast. Mm -hmm. um, we get mention of the animals but it's subverted um apparently i found this out that um both nimue and um morgan lefay are in the stage show and have songs but they're not in the movie so even elements of some of these kind of witchy ladies that you know were in the original sources that were in the stage play were some of the things that got cut for the film so that definitely made me question like, well, we get to this healing scene, but I I definitely was feeling like the message was that it was more um, an, a more natural explanation and its role was more as a catalyst for the change in the relationship than a culminating yeah. spiritual moment for Lancelot. Mm -hmm. uh, David and Noel have sent in some, some comments on the film and yeah. Uh, yeah, Arthur, that the Nimue song "Follow Me" is still in the film, right? So Nimue is in the, the film, isn't no, she? No, uh, not in the film. I definitely have heard that. Are there different versions? I've definitely well, it, heard. It. I mean, you might have heard it from the stage play because the the, the, the that record is. I mean, there are different versions of the film, but but uh, yeah. the version you see in is the doesn't is the more. longer cut, the mm -hmm. the version that you can obtain now. Okay, the theatrical cut was shorter. The soundtrack, yeah, like if you, okay. yeah. Well, the, it, yeah, the I'm looking at my the, song list. Safety. It might parts of "Follow Me" might be sung by like the chorus, but I don't think it's her necessarily. So maybe they used pieces of the music but didn't attach it to the character. Uh, yeah, you're right. On your song list, on your last slide, you have "Follow yeah. Me" in the children's chorus. So I guess the yeah. chorus singing it in the movie. So I wonder if they used a bit of the music but didn't give it in the full context that it was on the on, in well the they gave Nimue's song to the children's chorus that's not creepy well it says Good follow me and david I think, um, I think in the stage show it's earlier and they show merlin going off with her so they they mm -hmm. they moved it around and repurposed it a little bit and David was um, supposing that perhaps in Hollywood at that time, in the sort of 60s and 70s, they were a bit embarrassed by that kind of fairy tale magic. I mean, the, the one to look at actually is the 1963 Disney uh, version of The Sword in the Stone, which must have been in the back of people's minds um, when they were making the film, although it came out after the stage plays. The, the Broadway play is 1960, the Disney film is 63, and then the film is 67. Um, but you do have a very Disney scene, Disney-ish scene, um, towards the end uh, when um, Arthur goes back to Merlin's old schoolhouse and um, Mordred comes across him. And there are some incredibly drugged up animals, but you have the fox and the squirrel. Um, and then you also have a scene with Merlin and Arch Archimedes, the owl. Again, all these animals are just off their heads with drugs because I'm <laughs> sure a fox is not supposed to be that um, docile. And that scene was cut from the theatrical release, I believe, um, because okay. it was too long. And the, but, well, but also, I think tonally, it's weird and it's very fairy tale magic. Right. Well, speaking of drugged up animals, I would have thought a little druid nature magic would have suited the 60s and 70s just fine. That's true, well, actually. That's true. Yeah. Sure. Well, I mean, and, and yeah. The, 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 when they go a maying, that felt very like summer of love to oh, me. Like, I don't know that it would have yeah. in 1960. <laughs> I mean, yes. it's from Mallory. It will. Yes, I don't want to come back to that one, but uh, <laughs> but as, as I, I I place rather a lot of emphasis on the Maying passage in uh, in Mallory, and so was very interested in that as one of the most purely Mallory and non th white elements of the film. Um, but wow, did they do something different with that? But anyway, just for for a second, uh, back to the fantasy stuff. Um, Kat, I think I agree with you that the film, the even even the what looks like it could conceivably be understood as miraculous uh, resuscitation of Sir Dinadan seemed to have 
they didn't give any explanation for it, but it certainly seems cons- I, I, I got the feeling like I was being left to imagine it however I wanted to. Like if I wanted to imagine to stay within what the rest of the film seemed to be telling me that there's nothing supernatural going on and everything has a perfectly ordinary explanation apart from the guy who appear, appears to live backwards, but whatever, um, that I could do that if I wanted to see it in the context of something magical or miraculous, I could do that. Even if I wanted to see it as a kind of Christian miracle. Again, I thought the face to face, like him breathing his literal breath into the open mouth of Sir Dinadin and saying, live, live, live was definitely suggesting to me kind of almost, almost Adam in the garden of Eden, uh, uh, sort of biblical imagery to me as well, but it was very, nobody said anything Christian. Nobody, you know, you know, there was not a, you know, a, a miracle, God be praised. Like nobody, nobody said anything like that. Right. And so none of that was sort of forced upon us. And it could well have been simply that King Arthur is not really good at tree wounds right and so was ready to c- declare in doa when he like really had just swooned and was going to be okay in just a minute um <laughs> though as a public service announcement i would not recommend either hauling anybody like anyone who has had a, a disastrous fall like that hauling them up into a sitting position by their arms nor like pumping on their chests are really great methods uh when they may have large internal injuries and probable broken bones in their torsos but nevertheless like uh, with a little chest massage and some breathing into his mouth he didn't you know anyway whatever like maybe he just recovered maybe you know so if you if you didn't want to think of it as a fantasy story you were certainly able to right to just imagine like okay he recovered at this moment after we got to see, and Guinevere, more importantly, got to see how deeply affected Lancelot was by by this and everything, and her opinion of him was completely wrong and everything, and so that's fine. But it was almost like it was, it felt like it, it was sort of, uh, I don't know, maybe throwing a bone to the whole like fantasy roots of this, both the fantasy and the Christian roots of the story to some extent. It was, but it was, it was so. Um, uh, indirect, you know, so kind of silent and and shy about that, um, that I found that strange, especially given that this whole scene, as I said, is like the pivot point of the entire film, uh, really, in a lot of ways. And yet, like at that central turning point, they decided to, you know, not talk about it or tell us what was actually happening in that sense. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I just clicked off it and lost it, but could somebody read Arthur's Long com- Arthur Harrow's long comment out loud because it's good on this point, but it also brings me to brings us to the topic I most want to discuss. Oh, is that the one about the songs? Um, yeah, the one oh, about sexism. Yeah, yeah. So you so, can go back to the naked scenes and talk about yeah. And sexism. Yeah, maybe there's the slide about the maying. Maybe we should talk about that. Um, yeah. Or I think I kind of put that with the 1960s. So it's the slide about um, the Kennedys and stuff. Um, so Arthur Harrow says, well, we can actually go to, I'm sorry, slide six actually has this quote right on it. Oh, okay. The one you're um, going to read in Arthur's comment. He says, speaking of songs that did and did not get cut, um, I must note that the two songs above, I think the ones for Morgan and Nimue that got cut, um, which reference sin and make reference to sc- scantily clad damsels and so forth got cut, but got cut, but. How to Handle a Woman with its remarkably disturbing line, Merlin told me not to try to tell what a woman is thinking, they don't do it very often, was kept. I know that in the 60s this sort of thing was more acceptable than the sexual references in Fie on Goodness, which was cut, but I think this choice did not hold up well. So, yeah. Mm. And that's obviously not the only <laughs> moment of sexism. And Guinevere is played in some interesting ways. You know, she's often played as sort of brainless and kind of like a preteen girl, even though how old is Vanessa Redgrave? Like 40 when she's playing her. Um, and and yet there are also moments when she has depth of character and so forth, but not as often. I mean, she's mostly well, played as kind of frou-frou. Well, yeah, but the whole like 
Guinevere is a bad girl. Like, and she likes the bad boys that we got at the beginning, right? The whole thing with it, you know, when they're like, oh, it's a dark and dangerous forest. Like, you know, oh, do you think we will be waylaid by brigands? Like, you know, and, and when, uh, when she, you know, that, that, uh, that really sexually loaded exchange that she has with Arthur right at the beginning where she's like, oh, are you going to throw me down on the ground? And then he's like, no, my lady, I would never do that. And she says, why not? How dare you insult me like that, right? I mean, it's, yeah. you know, it's that whole attitude of her, like, I mean, I get it how it's, you know, being used into like, oh, she wants to have adventure and she's, a, you know, she's, she's rebelling against the whole arranged marriage thing and all that kind of, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's like adventure and spontaneity that she is in support of. But the initial view that we get of Guinevere from our first introduction of her is well, a little bit brain, I mean, understandable, but a little bit brainless. And again, that kind of like, you know, I am very naughty, you know, and, and, uh, you know, I like the things that I'm supposed to not like, and, you know, and I am looking for, I am not interested in the noble king that I have been set up with, but rather I'm, you know, I'm longing to be, you know, swept away by a hairy brigand from the woods, you know, um, and that's the whole... gonna fall at my feet and I'm going to play with every man. And then this is in complete contrast with her incredibly heartbreaking divided loyalty dilemma later that she really only ever loves two men in her whole life. She's not a flirt. She's not promiscuous. And it, right. you know, destroys her and breaks her in two that she's unfaithful to either of them with the other. Yeah. Right, right, right. And then yeah, the whole, exactly. and the whole scene with the rolling back. It's idealistic and naive, like Arthur is, but in a more dangerous way. Like, it's Arthur's ideals aren't like getting people killed. Whereas, you know, this line jumped out to me about, shall a feud not begin for me? Shall kith not kill their kin for me? And it's like, well, yeah, <laughs> like they might. And so and and but that actually comes true later. So her her idealistic yes. notions are dangerous in a way that I don't think Arthur's are necessarily shown to be. Mm -hmm. um, and to go back to the scene that you mentioned a lot earlier, Corey, the the naked scene with the rolling bathtub. Um, yes. What always drives me crazy about that scene is how they have such different priorities there. And like, he's so obsessed with thinking about his military and political priorities that he doesn't even notice, you know, her nudity and her attempts to flirt with him and so forth. Whereas she's yes. just like, that's okay, dear, come to bed the whole time. So again, it's yes. just like, all she ever wants is sex and romance. Whereas, you know, the man has these grand ideas for planning the kingdom and for settling law and justice and so forth. So that's very troubling and insulting. Um, Gabriel, what can you like talk about to what extent that's drawn from white or contrasts what's in white and the portrayal of Guinevere? Because I think some of that is true, but I don't necessarily get as strongly as here. Her kind of fantasies about meeting brigands in the woods. I don't, mm. unless I'm forgetting, I don't remember that coming across as strongly in the book. Yeah, no, I don't think that's in white at all. I mean, I mean, uh, uh, white's white's Guinevere is. Um, I mean, what, when White reread Mallory, I say there were two things he took from it. There's actually a, th a third thing as well, which is that the characters were real people. He said, um, not these kind of pre-Raphaelite prigs that he found in Tennyson and um, others of that of the Victorian writers. I mean, C.S. Lewis said the same thing actually. The, the, the people coming to Mallory. Um, after the Victorians were saying, wow, these are actual real people in Mallory, you know, like there's details like Lancelot stretches his legs on the Grail quest and stuff like that. So he's really emphasizing, um, White is emphasizing all these kind of real, whatever real thing, real humanity in these characters. And, and he, he makes Lancelot ugly as a result to sort of make him a bit more kind of like a, a person that actually exists. Um, and he also <laughs> talks about Guinevere's, um, Gu Guinevere getting older. Um, which you, you you can't do in a film unless you film it over the course of 20 years or something. Um, or you use sort of, well, now you would use CGI or something like that. Um, but that's kind of what he's talking about, um, what White's interested in. There's also a lot of times when Guinevere's looking out of a high window over everything else and she's sort of thinking about things and, and her place in the world. And she she I think she does think a lot more than um, she does in this film. 
Um, and that question, actually, Serena, you were talking about how intelligent Arthur is. Now, this was something else that T.H. White really struggled with um, through his redrafting process of the Once and Future King. And he really struggled with the question of, did Arthur know about Lancelot and Guinevere? Because if he didn't, he's an idiot because everyone know, knows about it. If he does know about it, then he's as bad as either of them because why didn't he do something about it earlier? And then in the end, White decides that Arthur could know about it, but decides not to act in order to keep the peace. And that's what happens in the Camelot film as well. Um, but having said that, White, uh, Arthur is a bit dumb in this film, even though he does have these big ideas about politics and yeah. the law and so on. Um, and in even in White, in The Once Future King, I mean, White emphasizes the fact that um, basically Arthur's just a normal guy. He, he, um, he would have been sort of, comfortable running the cricket team in the village that he's he, there's nothing particularly special about him um and so actually i think white's guinevere um in that context is kind of a bit more interesting um she does think about stuff she does have plans she does do stuff whilst white's arthur um really is just following merlin um and um and trying to be good uh, but isn't kind of a special, you know, bright spark or, or particularly um, uh, particularly interesting, actually. Um, White does emphasize how trapped Guinevere is with the limited number of activities that are available for her. When Lancelot yeah. is off on the Grail Quest, and especially when Lancelot comes home from the Grail Quest and says, that's it, um, celibacy from here on out, um, he, he lists, like, here are the only things that she could do. She could basically, like, do embroidery. And that's about it. Um, so she didn't have much scope. So unfortunately, that might get translated in the film into this really embarrassing, just sort of obsession with her own love life, imaginary love life. Uh, we have a bunch of comments to that nature too. David says that this could be part of her own naivete and upbringing. She's been trained that like that's what you are, like your bait for men. That's your only purpose, right? And um, White sees her as frustrated by womanly boundaries, says Noel. That's true. Um, so I, I'm aware that we're coming up on our two hours here. So this is flown by. I'm, I want to give Corey space to give his main spiel because I feel like that's relevant for for this discussion of Guinevere too. Well, yeah, because that was the thing which was it. <clears throat> okay, so I agree uh, with uh, the comment that Devora made basically that the film seemed to be whether accidentally or intentionally, at least repurposing the word lusty, right? Uh, in the whole concept of the lusty month of May. Um, and especially in the context of the Guinevere that we got at the beginning, which seemed like on the cusp of naive and flirtatious, right? Like, was she really like a bad girl or was she just naive, right? Was uh, you know, I think seemed to be a bit of a question there in, in the first sequence, in the woods, in the snow. Um, but then we get the lusty month of May and people jumping all over the place and rolling around in the in the grass. And the words of the song make it like, it's much more like, okay, so like we're into being naughty, like being naughty is good. This is what happens in May, right? Um, and it's about the, like, just like the runaway the runaway feelings, right? And I was not, you know, I was hoping for a little bit, right, of the like burgeoning and springing and, and everything else that happens there in Mallory, right? Um, but we weren't just getting burgeoning and springing. It was really, it was just like, with from Guinevere in particular, it seemed like primarily just licentiousness, really, right? Like, you know, like a, a, it was like Saturnalia, except in May. Basically, was almost like what how how it was being described. Like this is the the time when anything is sort of allowed. And it was weird because the um uh the the thing that was that was sort of interesting to me was the way that this was being juxtaposed sort of with Lancelot's arrival, 
right? Lancelot was arriving just as the Maying was going on, right? So here you have like the, the kind of juxtaposition of like, I am Lancelot and I have high ideals and think extremely highly of myself. Then like, let's go to like, there's Guinevere rolling around in the grass and singing about like how it's okay to be naughty in May, right? And I'm like, okay. Um, uh, it was, it was, it was sort of a strange, you know, again, I'm, I'm, I'm remembering back to like old love. And of course the whole conclusion, like the punchline of the entire lusty month of May passage in Mallory is his shout out to Guinevere, right? Like his defense of Guinevere at the end that he, you know, he, he singles out the fact that she was, was, was a true lover and therefore had a good end. Um, so that's the place, the first place I mean, the first place we ever get a glimpse of the fact that she's a going to have a good end and B is a virtuous person. He's been, he's been kind of playing that a little close to the vest oh. in the whole book to, before that point. Right. Um, whereas again, in the film, it was, it was doing almost the opposite as if it were just like preparing for the, 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 you know, the adulterous uh, carryings on later on. Um, oh, very much so. Yeah. 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 Specifically, yeah. she says this is the month when everybody takes vows that they're going to break and everybody tries to go find somebody to get in trouble with. Oh, look, there's a cute new knight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, of course, she hates him when she sees him. Right. So we get the immediate juxtaposition. You know, it's it's you know, they, they kind of played coy yeah, with it a little bit. Really... Right? It, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um and even, you know, the way in which, like, after Lancelot knocks Arthur off his horse when they first meet, you know, then Arthur invites him to go maying and he has to, like, translate it because that doesn't translate into whatever Lancelot's original language is. I know it's meant to be French, but it seemed to be, Gabriel, talk about shifting accents. My goodness. Like, mm. you know, <laughs> I forget. What's the name of the actor who played Lancelot? Uh, Franco? Uh, Nero. Euro? Yeah, he's Italian, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, Italian, yeah. My goodness, but like his accent like shifted almost every other line. It's like now he's French. Yeah. Now he's vaguely <laughs> German. Now he's <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was I was I was I was I was not really following his nationality. But anyway, like he didn't get May. Like he didn't understand it at all. Right. Mm. Um so I don't know. It was uh um I I mean I I thought that it worked well enough in the film, but I was certainly, I was certainly a little bit, uh, a little bit disappointed. And in particular, what I felt was, um, especially following up on, you know, from the first, the opening sequence, the sort of Guinevere as bad girl, you know, I want to be, you know, taken by a ruffian in the forest lines at the beginning. Um, the, the, the fall, like she's not falling from very far, you know, when she, uh, we, I mean, she's only really just fulfilling what she herself just sang about. And Serena, I agree with you when she's singing about it during the Maying sequence, it's not a hundred percent clear that she really means it. Right. Or certainly that she understands the real weight of it any more than she understands the shall Kith not ki uh, ki uh, kill their kin for me line. Right. That, of course, has a much more gravitas in retrospect, right, than she is aware of at the time. Um, so she has a fall maybe from, like, ignorance to realizing the, you know, the actual seriousness of the situation. Um, but she doesn't I, – I was disappointed that they weren't depicting her as, as, as having a much more serious kind of moral fall. Like, again, like her, her – uh, she seems totally fine with the idea of, um, uh, you know, breaking vows and, and, you know, engaging in scandalous relationships from literally the first time she shows up on screen. And I had a hard time with that. And that's what I, yeah. that's my main disappointment with the lusty month of May. Passage. It makes it much more Lancelot's fall that he's the one yes. who has mm -hmm. high moral ideal and at least high opinion of himself and so forth. So it's it's more like she was bound and determined to do this, even if she didn't think seriously about it. So it's more like it's his tragedy. Mm -hmm. Right. Wow. But then, of course, his tragedy was undermined by the fact that it was so hard to take him seriously when he was emphasizing his high ideals. And even Kat, as you were saying, with the same was song, the way that that seemed to be explicitly played for comedy. You know, I like think that. So. I mean, it's it's that's a that's a comedy song, I think. Yeah. 
Definitely. I that's how, that's how, how I saw you it too. That straight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and so it's, that was, and again, I guess in some ways I'm kind of getting back around to the genre thing. And another reason why I was missing corpses at the end is that I felt if it was the love story, if the, if the tragedy is the tragedy of their fall, I would have liked to see them up on a slightly higher footstool than they started off from, you know, before they didn't have far to fall at the beginning. And therefore, a, you know, a with if, if that's the, you know, if I'm supposed to see that as tragedy, um, you know, his uh, sort of difficult to take seriously high moral standards at the beginning crumble and her apparently not real strongly existent moral principles crumbling wherein lies the tragedy exactly um other than for for arthur you know i mean I, so unless we just want to see it simply as his own personal tragedy with him only at the beginning which of course to some extent the film invites us to right by framing it at the beginning and ending with you know arthur you know alone on a dark stage you know basically um soliloquizing or you know sort of speaking to the audience um mm -hmm. so i mean i guess we are at least permitted if not invited to think about it that way but um but again that's why i would have wanted for for there to be uh for the tragedy to hit me harder i would have wanted to to be thinking about the you know that focus more when i talk about corpses that for me that that is mostly you know a heuristic to talk about like the tragedy of the kingdom not just their relationships right mm -hmm. but of of the collapse of the kingdom um mm -hmm. and, and you know and, and, and the sexist. loss of life it's not only sexist but also a degrading of the tragedy to just make it like the men had everything in order and this you know, the seductress came along and it's always the woman's fault. This total double standard of like, well, Guinevere didn't fall because she was already a floozy, but you know, now Lancelot or Arthur, <laughs> they were the ones who were really suffering in this situation. Yeah, which also yeah. I think kind of contradicts the fact that the, the movie goes to such great lengths to show that Guinevere was in love with Arthur in the beginning, which most of the stories yes. gloss over. They don't know, um, you know, either she's yes. young or it's an arranged marriage, or we just, as a reader, we have no idea what, she feels about Arthur. We only really pick her up as a character once Lancelot's already in the scene. So I guess yeah. that could have, that, that's part of the tragedy too, is that she really does love Arthur, but yeah. that's and, up, and but to, you know, presented. Right, and in their defense, they kind of doubled down on that, right? With showing yeah. her being in an arranged marriage that she was totally unenthusiastic about, and then meeting him under slightly strange circumstances, not knowing who he really is. And so, you know, you get the, you get the have your cake and eat it too situation, right? Where you get to like fall in spontaneous love with a dare, with a dashing stranger and find out that he's also your prearranged husband. So yeah, I mean, you know, they, they, they were clearly trying to emphasize, you know, acknowledging the, the, you know, doing more than just acknowledging, um, the whole prearranged scenario, right? But yet showing that this was a, a mutual love relationship between the two of them. Right. Noel points out that these audiences did not want to think about politics, for example, Nixon and bodies, for example, Vietnam. Fair enough, fair enough. And I think maybe it was Noel who also pointed out a little earlier, the women's movement was fairly young in the 60s. Right. But see, I, I'm thinking about, uh, no, in, in contrast to that, now, again, the corpses are all off stage. We don't see corpses. But I'm thinking about how the Rankin-Bass Hobbit increased the fatalities in the in the Battle of the Five Armies, right? How we got, um, like, the Rankin-Bass Hobbit in their... In, in their very strongly anti-war ending of, uh, of, of the, the, their Hobbit adaptation, um, ratcheted up the named dwarf deaths, right? I'm forgetting which ones they killed off, but they killed off like three or four extra dwarves uh, in the battle for no good reason, apart from the fact of wanting to emphasize what a horrible waste and loss of life uh, war was for no good reason. Um, but no, even there, um, uh, we not only did we not get bodies, we didn't even get violence, right? We just saw like specks of uh, like dots and lines swirling in the distance, like you know a, a distant mayhem. We didn't get um, blood shed or you know corpses lying around and things. Anyway, yeah. The, um, well, there's a, oh, it, it's interesting. Yeah. 
I feel like that could be an interesting theme of like late 60s movies of an awareness of living in turbulent times, but also wanting to not totally go all the way of depicting it or hearkening back to a more civilized time. Um, it's uh, this year's, I just saw the other night in the movie theater, um, again, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, which is 50 years old this year. And there's a, it's a strange comparison, but it strikes me that there's a similarity there of, yeah, they're outlaws, but they're nice outlaws. Like they don't want to kill anybody. And when the, when the lawmen come, they run away. They don't fight. They just like hightail it to Bolivia. And the, you know, it's like Butch Cassidy and you never shot anybody before. And, and, you know, the film cuts before you see them die. So at the same time as it's engaging with all these themes of, the 60s and the violence and the world being a very harsh and tragic place it also the 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 longing for a simpler time is there and wishing that like an awareness at the end of the 60s that something is over that we're passing into some new stage and kind of wanting to sort of maybe have your cake and eat it too in that way of engage with these themes but not really depict them fully either so can you um cat can you share more from what you have in your notes about like how this story has been read in relation to violence in each of these different decades you actually had some notes there about bringing it down to reading the context yeah. of terrorism right now well so the only thing i noticed i don't have a lot just that um it kind of struck me that White is specifically writing in the context of um, World War II, and he mentions Hitler in the books that, you know, because Merlin has this backwards memory, he can make anachronistic references. So it's he's speaking to that time period. And then it would have, you know, I think been inescapable to think about Vietnam and, and other things in the 60s. And then um, I don't know whether I, maybe Gabriel knows if this was an explicit reference, but I just found out about this, um, the shooting that was in um, California recently. Um, that gunman referenced a book from the late 19th century called Might is Right, I think, um, by yeah. an anonymous author who called himself Ragnar Redbeard. And it, like, it's potentially satirical in the way of like Jonathan Swift, but I don't know that that's confirmed. Like it could be genuine and it's very like social Darwinism and racism and all these things. And a lot of people have like a lot of these kind of um, fascist movements have gone on to reference this book since then. And this gunman made reference to that online just recently, like, you know, in their investigation, they're finding this. So that's an interesting thing to immediately. I, I read that and I was like, might is right. Th Th White talked about that, you know. So I wondered whether that was a thing that he knew about, or whether that was just something in the air. Um, but it seems to me that it continues to be relevant. It's just that, you know, the the form shapes into to mold itself for the time. But each kind of generation has its own version of these terrible kind of you know acts of violence and everything that make this story relevant. Yeah. So I don't know. I just like looked this up like the other day. So I, I haven't done enough research to know whether this was a book that T.H. White would have known or, or if he picked the phrase up somewhere else or whether it was just coincidental. Uh, right. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. And I, do, I actually don't know the answer, um, but I, I'd like to look that up. I mean, he does quote Brian Merriman's um, 1780 Irish poem in the first edition of The Witch in the Wood, um, which which kind of paraphrases that idea. Um, the translation, loose translation, is the right thing is enthroned as the right thing. Uh, the, sorry, the powerful desist from inflicting wrongs and the right thing enthroned as the right thing. So it's kind of talking about might and, and right in that, um, depending on how you translate that. Um, of course, the, the idea of might is right is is um, is a very old idea. I mean, Thrasymachus talks about this in Plato's Republic. Um, the the just people are the ones with the strength. Um, but that actual phrasing "might is right" may um, may have been taken from um, this nineteenth-century book, or it may just be that it's it rhymes, and so you know 
lots of right. people have thought of Different it. But, like, but I, 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 I'd like to do more yeah. research. Yeah, yeah, it might maybe that he he had come across it. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the Nazis were all about might is right as well. Mm -hmm. So it's it's mm -hmm. certainly a, an age old idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and White's explicitly linking that with with that and in, in the sword in the stone and the ants and all that. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, yeah. So I mean, I I didn't necessarily have anything in mind in terms of analysis of that theme. It just seems to me that each time this story gets told, it kind of makes you think of whatever is going on currently, um, you know. <laughs> um, well, we're, there are, we're at two there hours, no, but... Uh, there are no scholarly articles that cite simultaneously T.H. White and Ragnar Redbeard, for what that's worth. Not yet. Right. Cat's about to write one. Exactly. <laughs> well, well, I'll get right on that. Well, um, uh, that yeah. was... That was so good, but also so sad and depressing. Cat, can we like wrap up with yeah, maybe so um, one or some I, other? Like, should we do I a sing along? Any, um, <laughs> I, I, what I was going to say is, uh, did, did, didn't uh, Guinevere and um, Lancelot get married in real life quite recently, 2006? Um, Vanessa Redgrave and um, Carl Drogo, whatever his name is, the uh, Italian <laughs> fellow who played Lancelot, they, they started dating, they met on the set. This is all according to Wikipedia, so it might be completely wrong. And then they <laughs> got married in 2006, and so they, they're currently married. They're both very much alive. Richard Harris, sadly, is deceased, but um, Guinevere and Lancelot are still alive, and they're married. So, that's so they got that married is... like 40 years after the film? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, according but... to Wikipedia, they they got married in 2006 that is really funny yeah. wow Aww. there is hope and <laughs> it, maybe they waited for richard harris to pass away i don't know he's, he's like, <laughs> they were like finally we can be together come out of the nunnery vanessa redgrave there is that moment when, in white when arthur thinks if only i could die then that would set everything right that's, that's, yeah that's true he yeah. fights lancelot in the melee right and he hopes lancelot will kill him <laughs> I just I just love that that mapping onto the actors' private lives in this. <laughs> ah, yeah. I was thinking more of like grand spiritual truths we can take away from the legend <laughs> to like give us hope in our current con political conditions or something. But you know, private lives of Hollywood. Well, that stuff. too. That too. <laughs> as long as it worked it's, out for it is three thirty in the morning. And Franco. <laughs> Um, yeah. yeah is there anything that was uh you guys were burning to discuss that we didn't touch on i think we got most of my main ones that i wanted to that i wanted to discuss well i have no idea how popular the film still is but as yeah. the discussion and as the course that we just had show like arthuriana in general is as alive and well as ever. Now, we haven't had a really good King Arthur movie in a while, but there's still plenty of novels and video games, and then just the themes keep showing up over and over, and we're in this heyday right now of fantasy and especially superhero films that either draw a lot from or at least overlap significantly with the whole like Arthurian complex of legends. So there is something immortal about these stories, um, at least in Western culture, and I'm sure there are analogs and overlaps in other cultures as well. You know, not necessarily with similar sources, but there are things about this kind of story that uh, appeal to perennial human needs and loves. Yeah, yeah, I, absolutely. And I mean, this uh, last year I was um, giving a lecture to a group of um, 20 young um, men and women, sort of all about 20 years old, very intelligent, and they're all from different sub-Saharan African countries. I was in Kampala doing some teaching, and I said to them at the start, hands up if you've heard of King Arthur. Two people put their hands up, one person from Mozambique and one woman who uh, was from Sudan but had moved to Ethiopia when she was nine. And they had both just heard of King Arthur. They didn't know anything about it, really. And then I, so I told the story of King Arthur, um, and I found myself sort of modeling it to them a little bit. They were all orphans. They were all on this leadership program. And I was talking about Arthur as an orphan on, who became a great leader, who we could learn from, actually, um, some of his leadership qualities. And at the end, I said, 
So what do you think? Do you hands up if you like King Arthur? And they all shot their hands up. They they loved it and they hadn't heard of it before. And actually a similar group to that, um, not those exact people, but a similar group. I, I read out a quote from the Sword in the Stone, that wonderful passage about the best thing for being sad is to learn something. And afterwards, a, a young woman from um, Tanzania came up to me and said, I love that story. My dad used to read me T.H. White um, every night. Uh, so, it, you know, it, 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 the, the Arthurian story does work wonderfully across cultures. And actually, Takako, I think, who's here tonight, was talking about the Japanese King Arthur as well. Um, so, yeah. you know, it, it does work very well. And T.H. White works quite well across cultures, clearly, as well. Right. Yeah, yeah, That's it's true. Sorry, <laughs> we yeah. with. Absolutely, and you know, and Serena, there have been a, although there may not have been any great Arthurian adaptations lately. There still have been lots of them. There haven't been so many feature films, but you know, there was there was the the comparatively recent new Merlin, you know, young Merlin series. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was the even more recent Camelot series, um, you know. So there, you know, there there have been even just within the last ten years, you know, numerous new uh, uh, film adaptations of it um, in different ways. So uh, you know, it's it's definitely um, something that is still very much. Even though I, I I agree with you, it feels like a long time since we've had like a, a really really good Arthurian mm -hmm. adaptation. Um, but uh, but it's still nevertheless something people keep keep going back to that again and again. So uh, I'm uh, I'm surprised that we haven't had a good long once in future King adaptation um, of trying to do the 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 full story like without compartmentalizing it as this one does. Kind of just focuses on the the love triangle um, or the. Disney movie just as the sword in the stone. Um, um, maybe it's because of that shift in tone. I don't know, but I'm surprised we haven't had like the premiere channel mini series, you yeah. know, 10 episode version of the once in the future King or something. I don't know. I'm kind of waiting for yeah. that announcement to come from somebody at some point. Mm. Well, or I think perhaps, perhaps, so sorry, go on. No, I was just going to say really quickly, perhaps to say the same thing the other way around, it's really interesting that the serial adaptations of the Arthurian story that we have had over the last 10 to 15 years have not been interested right. in T.H. White in the same way that this, you know, the, the, the film and the play were. Mm -hmm. Anyway, sorry, Gabriel, go ahead. Oh, well, I was, I, on that point, I mean, the uh, recent Arthurian adapt, adaptation, um, The Kid Who Would Be King by Joe Cornish um, right. does play on white a lot. It's very good. It, it actually combines Tolkien and white in quite interesting ways, um, referencing oh, wow. both. Um, I mean, I, I, my feeling with white is that the Sylvia Tans and Warner biography did, um, d didn't do his reputation any, any, um, any favors. <laughs> any favors. Um, however... Yeah. It, it yeah and well it's it's I mean it's critical of white for for good reason. Um, the H is for Hawk um, book, which was a bestseller, um, does sort of bring white back into popular um, appeal a little bit. I mean, but of course you know the story should exist on its own merit as well, and and perhaps it is time, and and there will be a a, a new version, especially because a lot of time has passed since white passed away, um, in sixty four. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, in, we're in the age of like Netflix and Amazon and, um, Hulu and HBO and all the rest of it picking apart, you know, looking for the next, um, Game of Thrones. Right. Or, I was just going to say, in a way, Game of Thrones probably filled that cultural need because, you know, we have dragons and epic battles and huge love stories and kings and queens and Incest. all that. Um, Incest, yeah, but that, yeah. that's not in, that's not in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> um, but now that's over. So now we need our huge epic yeah. dragon kings and queens. There, I think I think there's the the rumor is that Disney are going to do a remake of the Sword in the Stone because they're going mm. through all their back catalog and they're right. doing live action versions of everything. And I think that would be fantastic. And if it's a success, then they might do more, perhaps. But actually, mm. the last few King Arthur films have bombed in the box office, and also the last few Robin Hood films. Um, the Guy Ritchie King Arthur film was supposed to be part of like a five film series. And it just didn't do well enough. Um, so it, it, studios are a little bit wary about King Arthur at the moment. Um, mm. Maybe because, as so you say, Serena, 
we're scratching that itch through Game of Thrones and superhero films at the moment, but we'll come yeah. back to it. And then the, whatever this Lord of the Rings Amazon series is going to be, exactly. and then the Narnia TV show. And... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we shouldn't complain, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Well, y'all, it's not 4 o'clock in the morning for me, but I want to go to bed. So yeah. It is for some of us, so, yeah, we should probably log off. Um, thank you all so much for coming. This was great. I'm glad we finally found the time and made it happen. Um, Absolutely. Very good. Thank yeah. you so much for all your comments. Chat everyone so much fun. Yeah. we've uh, we i've been reading them all we haven't been able to sort of read them out but um i've been reading them all and there's been some lovely ones and uh oh, it's it's so great pleasant. to get your input <laughs> yep all right yeah. all right thanks, thanks everybody thanks then good night everyone bye bye, -bye.